I spent the last 12 years working as a park ranger. This job means the absolute world to me. This time spent in Glacier National Park, Montana, has seriously shaped who I am. I'm Braden, by the way. People think that the work of a park ranger consists mostly of wandering through the woods talking to tourists and making sure the place stays clean. They're not wrong, I do this, but my primary duties are a lot more serious than that. Most people who get lost in these mountains never see their families again. We spend a lot of time combing through the woods trying to find them. We find traces, occasionally, sometimes abandoned backpacks or the skeletal remains of people who got attacked by bears or mountain lions or succumbed to the elements. Even less frequently, do we find the lost person, alive. But the odds are seriously stacked against them from the outset. It happened last Thursday. We received a call from a frantic mother. She said her son didn't return from his hike that started at the Grinnell Glacier Trailhead. I've heard these calls too many times, and it never gets easier. It's hard to remain hopeful when you know the odds. The park's vast, and even though we know this area like the backs of our hands, it's like trying to find a lost penny in a haystack. Three of us searched, along with our search and rescue dogs. After several hours scouring the usual paths, I know the Grinnell Glacier Trail by heart, there was absolutely no sign of him. The hiker's name was Elroy, his mother begged us to do whatever we could. She said, he's an experienced hiker. I couldn't tell her this doesn't really matter when you're faced with the sheer scale and unpredictability of Glacier National Park. As the daylight dwindled, so did any remaining hope I was holding on to. Then Max, one of our lead search and rescue rangers, yelled, Braden. Over here, I think I found something. I ran faster than my legs could manage. That adrenaline kick, the desperation, it's the only thing that kept me going on these searches. There it was. Or rather, there he was. Elroy, huddled on the ground under a tree. He's alive. I shouted. His face was badly cut up and bruised, his clothes torn. He didn't look good, but hey, neither would I if I'd been out here for a whole night and however many hours since his mom called us. Max and I tried to lift Elroy to his feet, but he kept mumbling, no. It'll see us. It'll be back. See what, Elroy? What are you talking about? I asked, concern washing over me. He wouldn't get up. I don't blame him, when you're that disoriented from exposure, fear, probably some head trauma, you're not exactly making rational decisions. I figured it was better to stabilize him here, get the stretcher, and then haul him out of here. Stay here with Elroy, I'll call this in and get Ben with the stretcher, Max said, getting up to leave. Before my brain could even process what was happening, I caught a flash of movement from the corner of my eye. Max, watch, but I was too late. It moved in a blur. A blur of fur and muscle, faster than anything I'd ever seen. Max didn't even have time to turn before it slammed into him. He crumpled to the ground, unmoving, while a blood-curdling growl tore through the air. Max! I shouted, frozen in place as a creature that I honestly couldn't make sense of emerged from the tree line. I'd always laughed at those Bigfoot stories tourists sometimes came in with. I thought it was funny a way to keep the park mystique alive, but what stood in front of me, no freaking way was this a bear. I could see its shape shifting in the growing darkness, as though trying to decide what form to settle on. 
tall, almost impossibly so. And I don't mean bare upright tall, I mean lanky, unnaturally lanky. Its limbs seemed too long, distorted somehow. I saw what looked like claws longer than my fingers jutting out from its hands, and when the moon broke through the clouds briefly, I saw, God, I don't even want to think about it. Teeth, a mouth of full of those things, rose upon rows of needle-like horrors. It tilted its head at me. In that moment, I think I just blacked out, because the next thing I remember is Elroy screaming. He didn't just scream, those were the sounds of someone on the brink of absolute madness. He was scrambling, flailing his arms, trying in vain to fight off what had him. Elroy! I ran, I don't even know if I thought it through, all I knew was I couldn't stand there like a coward. It had Elroy by the neck, and even as I got closer, the light from the moon revealed the damage already done. That poor kid didn't stand a chance. His body was ripped and torn, blood staining the ground like something out of a horror movie. I was screaming, leave him alone. You, you monster. I had nothing, no weapon besides my pathetic little ranger flashlight, but that blind rage surging through me, it made me act. I threw myself at the creature, the flashlight raised like a club. I aimed for its head, I think, or maybe I was just swinging wildly, but either way, the metal of my light connected with something. It made a sound, a high-pitched screech that hurt my ears. Then, it dropped Elroy's mangled body like a used-up toy and turned on me. If the thing was terrifying before, the light reflected in its eyes was a nightmare from hell. Eyes so black they were like pits of absolute nothingness, but there was a shine to them, an unmistakable intelligence that sent a chill down my spine. It snarled, and I stumbled back, my knees threatening to buckle, but I somehow kept my balance. My flashlight had fallen to the ground, and now I was totally defenseless. I saw the creature crouch, muscles rippling over its elongated shape, getting ready to pounce. I closed my eyes. I'd heard the stories of survivors, how they'd played dead and bears sometimes lost interest, but this, this wasn't a bear. It was something far more primal. Something almost, mythical. But if there was a chance, any chance at all, I had to take it. I didn't want to die, but I was starting to accept that I probably would. That's when a gunshot ripped through the silent night, the sound blasting off the mountains. I startled, and my eyes flew open. The creature had turned away from me, and was crouched low, its shoulders trembling slightly. It let out a frustrated roar, a sound that was almost, dare I say it, hurt. Another gunshot echoed out, and I saw a figure with a rifle standing on the ridge, the silhouette clear against the moonlit sky. Get to safety, ranger. The voice was firm, female. It was Sarah, one of the newer rangers. Oh my god, there was actually someone out there to save my reckless behind. The creature sprang at Sarah. I heard her scream, a sharp cut-off sound of pure terror. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding against my ribs as I searched for something, anything, I could use to help. Spotting my discarded flashlight, I lurched for it. Sarah! No! I screamed, finding my voice at last. If I could find the switch, I could at least blind the damn thing, maybe provide her with a chance to get away. Another gunshot rang out, the sound reverberating through the woods. The creature staggered mid-leap and I saw a spray of blood erupt from its side. Sarah must have hit it, but it wasn't enough to stop it. 
She kept firing as it landed, and in the flickering moonlight, I could see its movements, impossible bursts of speed blurring its form. Sarah dodged a swipe from its claws, but her rifle clattered away, sliding down the rocky slope. The thing was on her in the blink of an eye. She tried to fight, but she was hopelessly outmatched. The sickening sounds of breaking bones and Sarah's agonized cry cut through me like a knife. Blind fury surged through me. I don't know how I did it, but I managed to turn on the flashlight and charge towards the creature, the beam slicing through the darkness. I shone the light straight into its eyes, causing it to rear back, screeching in rage. I knew I bought Sarah maybe a fraction of a second, a tiny window, and I refused to let her death be meaningless. Run! Find the others! I yelled. Her eyes, usually so full of laughter and warmth, were now wide with terror. Yet, she somehow found the strength to nod and stumble away, disappearing into the trees behind her. The creature was hissing in rage, its dark eyes fixated on me. It was an unsettling intelligence in those black pools, a primal cunning that gave me the sinking feeling this wasn't over. I backed away slowly, keeping the torch trained on it. Even injured, it could outpace me a hundred times over. Suddenly, it lunged at me, its teeth bared in a monstrous snarl. I barely had time to duck, rolling along the ground and coming up a few yards away. That clawed hand had sliced my uniform, and a stinging warmth began spreading across my shoulder. It had nicked me, not deeply, but still enough to draw blood. I heard the sound, a low growl emanating from the creature before me. It was pacing back and forth now, its attention momentarily not on attacking, but on the blood dripping from my arm. Its head tilted again in that unnerving way, and a flicker of recognition crossed those impossibly black eyes. The creature opened its mouth, revealing those rows of blood-smeared teeth, and a guttural chuckle echoed in the clearing. It sounded rusty, and used, as if speech wasn't something it often practiced. Food. It rasped, the word barely human, more like a primal instinct given voice. I turned and ran. All my ranger training, all the protocols, were useless now. Instinct screamed at me to get away to disappear into the vastness of the woods and hope to God this thing didn't come after me. But even as I fled, I knew it would follow. It wanted me. I was what it had come out here for. It's prey. I didn't stop running, didn't dare look back. Every rustle of leaves, every creak of a branch, was it closing the distance. Finally, I stumbled into a small clearing and gasped for breath. My lungs burned, my legs were ready to collapse. Ahead of me, I saw it, the ranger station. If I could get there, maybe there was a weapon, a radio, a way to signal for help. But could I outrun it long enough? Hope bloomed in my chest, a desperate flame flickering against the overwhelming odds. I pushed my exhausted body to move faster, my eyes locked on the small wooden structure ahead. I burst through the doors, slamming them shut behind me, and fumbled for something, anything, to lock them. There had to be a deadbolt. A heavy thud slammed against the door. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was outside, trying to batter its way in. Each slam sent vibrations through the wood, which was already starting to groan under the assault. My frantic gaze darted around the room. A phone. There, an old landline mounted on the wall. Lunging for it, 
I managed to dial 911 before the line went dead. The creature must have ripped the wires out. Hello? Hello? I shouted into the useless receiver, before slamming it back down. Another heavy slam shook the door. It wouldn't hold much longer. A rifle, there was usually a rifle stored inside. My eyes landed on the fireplace, an old-fashioned stone hearth, with kindling and firewood neatly stacked beside it. In the corner, next to the hearth, a metal poker glinted in the dim light. I grabbed the poker, the cold metal a shock against my clammy hand. It wasn't much, but it was something. As the wood finally splintered under the force of the onslaught from the other side, I took a deep breath and faced the warped doorway. The creature squeezed its grotesque body through the opening, its misshapen limbs bending and twisting at unnatural angles. The fight was short, brutal, and fueled by pure terror. I had no defense against its speed or strength. But I wasn't going down without a fight. In the chaotic blur of motion, the poker connected with solid flesh, making the creature yelp in pain. But its claws found my leg, tearing gashes in my thigh and sending me sprawling. I lay crumpled on the ground, tears mixing with blood as I stared in horror at the thing towering over me. There was blood now coating its muzzle, its teeth glistening crimson. In the dim light of the ranger station, its eyes, those endless black wells, glinted with a terrible triumph. As it opened its monstrous maw to finish me, a gunshot rang out. The creature jerked, a crimson bloom spreading across its chest. Another shot, and it staggered back. Ben and a group of rangers were storming through the remnants of the door, their faces pale, their eyes wide. The creature snarled, then lurched through a window, disappearing into the night. I could hear the rangers shouting, the sound of boots pounding on the hard ground as they gave chase. But somehow, I knew it wouldn't do any good. Whatever that thing was, it would always be a part of these woods now, a shadow in the trees, a nightmare waiting to strike. They found Sarah a few days later. What was left of her? There wasn't much to bury. Max's body was never recovered. As for me, well, I lived, barely. The doctors pieced me back together as best they could, but the scars I carry run far deeper than the wounds that healed. The park service offered all the counseling in the world, but how do you explain what you saw in those woods to a well-meaning therapist? They called it an animal attack. Bear, maybe or an abnormally aggressive mountain lion driven wild by hunger. I let them, I don't correct them. Some things just can't be explained away. Those eyes, that, that voice. They haunt my dreams even now. I resigned. Glacier National Park still holds my heart, still calls to me in my dreams, but I can't go back. It's its domain now. And something tells me, if I did, the creature would be waiting for me. Okay, maybe coming out to Shenandoah National Park wasn't my smartest move ever. But hey, the brochure had been convincing. All those photos of mist-covered mountains, promises of crisp, clean air and serene nature. It was exactly what I needed after the nightmare of those last few months. And yeah, my name's Rowan. Me, well, let's just say life decided to throw me a few curveballs. My partner passed away, the whole situation a freaking mess. Then I almost lost my job at the animal shelter on account of, 
well, let's say I'm not the best at compartmentalizing my feelings sometimes. A breathe, explore nature, and try to get a handle on your life sabbatical seemed like a good option, a desperate one, maybe, but still. Now, though, I'm questioning the logic. See, I rented this cabin way out on the edge of the park. It's supposed to be off the beaten track, but this is more like the middle of freaking nowhere edition. The kind of place where cell service is a hopeful rumor, and the GPS gave up trying to direct me a good 10 miles back. Still, the cabin itself was kinda cozy, and after I got the fire going in the stone fireplace, it was almost nice. The first day I went on a long hike, a trail that looped way back behind the cabin. It was gorgeous, all towering trees filtering the sunlight. Even the slight drizzle of rain that began as I reached the turnaround point couldn't spoil my mood. That night, though, that's where things got weird. I was dead tired after all the hiking but woke up around 3 a.m., restless as heck. Then I heard it, a scratching noise, coming from somewhere outside. At first, I figured it was some kind of animal, a raccoon, maybe. But the scraping kept up, relentless. Then came a high-pitched whine, almost like a dog crying. Now, I was on edge. There's always stories about park dangers, bears, cougars, even the occasional rabid fox. I crept out of bed and grabbed the old-fashioned flashlight from the bedside table. Edging closer to the window, I peer out into the darkness. Nothing. I breathed out, half irritated, half relieved. Stupid shelter dog instincts getting the best of me. I was about to turn away from the window when a flash of movement caught my eye. A large, dark shape, hunched near my porch. My heart did that annoying kick in my chest. As the figure edged closer into the faint porch light, I could make out its outline. Tall, lean, but not the lumpy build of a bear. This thing, whatever it was, moved too fast too fluidly. It stopped at the edge of the porch, and I could finally see it fully. I know this is gonna sound nuts, but I swear, it looked like a cross between a dog and a person. Its body was too long, its limbs almost, gangly. But its head, that's where things got real disturbing. Elongated, with a snout, and what seemed like, antlers, I couldn't make out its eyes, just a sense of them focused on me, intelligent. It tilted its head slightly and let out another of those whining cries. Then, its arm extended, the hand twisting into what looked like a monstrous claw. I stumbled back, fumbling with the flashlight. In the flicker of light, I saw, blood. Dripping from its claw and streaked down its muzzle. Oh God, had it, killed something? Panic kicked in. This wasn't some harmless animal, it was a predator, and it was right out there on my porch. I needed a weapon, something. The kitchen was in the back room. Could I make a run for it? Would I even have time to grab a knife before? The scratching started again. Then came a sound that made my blood run cold, the whine morphed into a chilling, almost human laugh. It raked its claws along the window, the piercing shriek of metal on glass tearing through the night. Hey, Ranger, a voice rasped, a voice I hadn't heard before, rough and almost amused. I couldn't make out the words clearly, but the tone was unmistakable. It was, taunting me. My mind raced. Was it mimicking someone it had, encountered earlier? Maybe some unlucky hiker? The thought made me nauseous. 
that's when I saw the blood. Not streaks on its muzzle this time, but fresh, dripping trails smeared across the window pane. Someone else's blood. Frantic, I looked around for a way out. Forget the kitchen, the back window was just a few feet away. I could make a break for it, into the woods, anywhere but here. As I lunged, the figure outside smashed through the window. Glass showered inwards, and I screamed, trying to cover my face, but not before I caught a glimpse of its face. No eyes, just dark, empty sockets where they should have been, and that monstrous, grinning maw. I scrambled through the shattered window the sting of cuts forgotten amongst the adrenaline. Stumbling onto the grass, I didn't look back but bolted like a terrified rabbit into the trees, the woods that had seemed so picturesque now looked full of shadows, lurking shapes and those empty, hungry eyes. I ran until my lungs threatened to burst, until I tripped and fell headlong into a ditch. I didn't know how long I lay there, curled in a ball. Every rustle of leaves, every twig snap, set my whole body trembling. At some point, I realized the rain had stopped. When the first light began filtering through the trees, I forced myself to rise. I have no idea where I am, even less so where the cabin is. My phone's dead, my ankle definitely sprained. All I can do is keep moving hoping against hope that whatever that thing was back there is just a nightmare I'll soon wake up from. I stumbled along, limping through the forest as the sunlight barely peeked through the dense canopy overhead. Every ache and throb in my body was a painful reminder of last night, of the creature in that impossible, grinning face. I tried to retrace my steps, but it was pointless. This part of the park was a tangled maze of trees and undergrowth, everything looked terrifyingly the same. Fear mixed with exhaustion, turning my thoughts in endless loops. What was that thing? Some kind of mutated animal? A forest spirit from those old folk tales? It didn't seem real, and yet, the blood on the window was grimly real. The rest of the day was a blur. I kept walking, driven by a desperate, primal urge to find some sign of civilization, a road, a trail, anything. I must have looked like a half-crazed castaway, clothes torn, mud-stained, and talking to myself in a ragged whisper. By late afternoon, my sprained ankle was a throbbing nightmare, and I was dangerously dehydrated. My throat felt like sandpaper, and my stomach churned with hunger. Just when I thought I couldn't take another step, I stumbled across it, a deer carcass. At first, a wave of revulsion washed over me. Then, raw hunger took over. I'd never been the survivalist type, but I wasn't sure I had a choice. After checking the surroundings for signs of whatever had killed this poor creature, I cautiously approached. The wounds weren't typical of any predator I knew. They were ragged, almost, torn. It was like something had shredded the deer apart. I forced down the rising nausea, if I wanted to survive, I had to use whatever resources I could find. My hands shook as I picked up a sharp rock, the stone edge surprisingly effective in cutting away chunks of meat. I ate raw, the metallic taste of blood mixing with the wild tang of venison. A part of me screamed in protest, but another part, that same instinct that had kept me running all day, silenced it. I had to survive. As the last shreds of light disappeared, a wave of renewed terror swept over me. The thought of being out in those woods, vulnerable and alone after what I had seen, made every muscle seize up. I tried to find a place to hide, 
a sheltered spot, but in my weakened state, the best I could manage was curling up at the base of a wide tree, desperately hoping it provided some cover. Sleep did not come easy. Every rustle of leaves, every distant animal cry, made me jolt awake, my heart pounding. My mind raced, trying to rationalize whatever was out there, but reason felt in short supply. What haunted me most, though, wasn't the creature's monstrous form, but that chilling imitation of a human voice. It suggested a level of intelligence, a sadistic amusement that was far more horrifying than mere animal instinct. The night stretched on, and I drifted between fitful half-sleep and panic-stricken alertness. Finally, just as the faintest hint of dawn tinted the sky, I heard it, footsteps. Not the padding of an animal, but a deliberate tread, branches snapping with a weight behind them. My breath caught in my throat. It was coming closer. Then, that voice again. Well, well, look who's still alive. It rasped, that same mocking inflection sending cold shivers down my spine. I squeezed my eyes shut, trying to disappear into the roots of the tree. Maybe it wouldn't see me, maybe it would get bored and leave. Playing dead, hm? Smart move with a bear. The voice continued, and a low chuckle echoed through the trees. Guess you haven't figured out who I am yet, little ranger. With a jolt of horror, I realized, ranger. He knew I was a ranger. This wasn't a random attack, it was targeting me. But why? That's when I remembered the smear of blood I'd seen on the creature's muscle the night before. Had someone else encountered this thing out here? Someone it had killed? A fellow ranger perhaps? The footsteps stopped right in front of my hiding spot. I held my breath, waiting for those claws to descend on me, waiting to feel them shredding my flesh like they had the deer. Don't worry, the voice said, almost conversational now. I'm not going to kill you. Not yet, anyway. You're far more fun alive. A rustling sound. Then something heavy was dropped near me, landing with a soft thud. Even without looking, I knew what it was. A backpack. My backpack. The one I had left on the porch of the cabin last night. You might need this, the voice said, and I swear, I heard genuine amusement in its raspy tone. After all, this game is only just starting. Then, the footsteps faded away, swallowed by the undergrowth. I lay there, hardly daring to breathe for long minutes after it was gone. When I finally worked up the courage to open my eyes, I was alone. Slowly, I uncurled myself and reached for my backpack. It was intact, everything seemingly untouched. Then realization hit me. My flashlight. It should have been in the front pocket. Frantically, I rummaged through the bag, the sickening feeling of certainty sinking in. No flashlight. The creature had deliberately returned it. It wanted me to see what was out there hunting me. I don't know how long I sat there, staring at the bag in horrified disbelief. The woods seemed to stretch on forever, full of shadows and unseen terrors. Part of me wanted to stay put, paralyzed by fear. But another part, fueled by a desperate, flickering survival instinct, knew I couldn't. Whatever it was, it had given me a head start, a twisted sporting chance. I had to take it. With shaking hands, I slung the backpack on, grabbed a sturdy branch for a makeshift walking stick, and began limping away moving deeper into the woods. Where to, 
I had no idea. It didn't matter. If this thing wanted me, it would find me, no matter where I hid. They found me four days later, a search and rescue team finally picking up on the faintest signal from my phone, buried and broken at the bottom of my back. I was beyond dehydrated, starved to the point of emaciation, with cuts and bruises covering every inch of me. Delirious, I babbled wildly about monsters, about voices in the woods. I don't remember much else, only snatches of kind faces and the soft beeps of hospital machines. When I woke up properly, it was to the sympathetic smile of a park ranger and a concerned-looking therapist. It took everything I had to tell them a sanitized version of the truth, about getting lost, about an animal attack, leaving out any mention of the creature or its eerie, laughing voice. They looked at me with that infuriating blend of pity and disbelief, like I was just another traumatized victim unable to cope with the harsh reality of the wilderness. I was discharged a few weeks later, physically on the mend, but haunted by a terror that refused to fade. News reports popped up occasionally, sightings of a strange creature, missing hikers. None of them ever definitively linked to what I saw out there, always explained away as animal attacks or tragic accidents. But I knew. It was still out there, watching, waiting. I never went back to Shenandoah. I couldn't get the image of that blood-splattered window and those empty eye sockets out of my head. The shelter job was gone too, my old life shattered like the glass of that cabin window. People tell me I'm lucky to be alive. Maybe I am. But sometimes I wonder if that thing in the woods had been right all along. Maybe the game isn't over. Maybe I'm not really living anymore, just surviving until the next time it decides to come play. If anyone ever tells you there's nothing scary in the wilds of Yellowstone National Park, well, just hand them a flashlight and point them towards Specimen Ridge Trail come nightfall. That's where I first saw it. Me, being Asher, park ranger with six years on the job and a healthy respect for things that go bump in the night. See, most folks think Yellowstone's all geysers and grizzlies, predictable stuff, dealt with by the manual. But there's those of us no deeper, feel that low hum of something old and untamed beneath the pretty postcard surface. Anyways, it was early summer, a few weeks after we found Peterson's boat abandoned on Yellowstone Lake. Dude was an experienced fisherman, knew the waters like his own backyard. No sign of him, not a trace. Not even the boat looked messed up, like there'd been a struggle or an accident. Just, empty, as if Peterson had evaporated into the mist. Put the whole park on edge, it did. Search and rescue went in for days, turned up nothing but whispers among us rangers that something ain't right with the lake. They sent me out to patrol the Specimen Ridge area, said it was quiet low priority, but my gut said otherwise. Them towering petrified trees give the place a haunted feel, like even the birds know to steer clear. It was near dusk when I reached the ridge proper, the last light turning the whole place a spooky shade of bone white. That's when the smell hit me. Rotten, but not like a dead animal, mixed with something, older, more sour, like turned earth and bad water. I couldn't place it, but it raised the hair on the back of my neck. I radioed it in, standard protocol, and they just tell me to be cautious, the usual. The woods were dead silent, not so much as a squirrel squeaking. I reached for my flashlight, the beam cutting a path through the deepening gloom. That's when I saw the eyes. 
two of them, low to the ground, glowing with a dull greenish light that made my blood run cold. They were wide set, whatever owned them was big. Bear? Way too low. Mountain lion? Ain't never seen a cat with eyes that shine like that. I froze, one hand on my rifle, the other on the bear spray clipped to my belt. The eyes blinked slow, then vanished, and I thought maybe I was seeing things, nerves on high alert after the Peterson thing. But then a branch snapped from somewhere in the inky blackness to my right, followed by a rustle of leaves. Whatever it was, it was circling me. I shouted, trying to sound brave, Park Ranger, identify yourself. No answer, just that eerie silence. The hair on my arms was standing straight up. My gut instinct screamed at me to get the hell out of there, but protocol said stay put, observe, wait for backup. Idiot, I know but you try going against six years of training. That's when I made my big mistake, I turned my back for just a second to scan the other side of the trail. Big, dumb, and predictable. Turns out, whatever that thing was, it was damn fast and silent as the grave. I heard the whoosh of air right before it slammed into me from behind, knocking me clean off my feet. I hit the ground hard, my rifle flying from my hands. The creature was on me in a flash. Thank the heavens my gear was heavy duty, because I felt those claws rip through my backpack, barely scraping skin. The creature snarled, a guttural, rasping sound that made the flimsy hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. It stank of the same sour rot as before and up close, even in the dim light, I saw its hide was patchy and gray, stretched too tight over knobby bones. Its head, it was all wrong, too narrow, the snout too long and pointed. Blind fury must have kicked in because the next thing I knew I was scrabbling for my bear spray, fumbling with the safety. The creature lunged again, and I unleashed the spray right in its face. It shrieked, this awful, piercing sound that echoed through the petrified trees and seemed to shake the very air. Even as it writhed and coughed, I could see the damage the spray did, its skin bubbled and blistered, the smell of burning hair filling the clearing. The green glow in its eyes flickered, dimmed for a second. It was enough. I scrambled back, snatched up my fallen rifle and ran for my dear life. I didn't stop running until I burst back onto the main trail, lungs on fire and heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. I radioed for help, my voice shaking. Didn't care about protocol no more, spilled everything, the Peterson thing, the eyes, the attack, the whole nine yards. They sounded skeptical, at first but the urgency must have bled through my words. Took him way too long to get a rescue team out there, by which point the only sign of a struggle was my torn up pack and the lingering stench of burnt hair and fear. The next few weeks were hell in a ranger uniform. They didn't find any trace of that creature, no fur, no blood, nothing to go on besides my eyewitness account which had everyone looking at me like I'd finally snapped after the Peterson incident. Officially, the report chalked the whole thing up to bear attack, emphasis on possible misidentification and low-light conditions. Right. Like I don't know my Yellowstone fauna. I tried to settle back into a routine, but every creaking floorboard at the ranger station had me jumping, Every shadow outside my window looked just a bit too long. Started carrying a sidearm even on off-duty strolls, which ain't exactly normal round these parts. Folks noticed the concerned frowns from fellow rangers, the way tourists gave me a wide berth, like I carried some kind of contagion. 
Couldn't blame him. Sleep was a no-go. Kept replaying the attack, seeing those glowing eyes, its unnatural shape, smelling that damn sour rot smell. Then the dream started. Man, those were worse than the sleeplessness. I'd be standing on Specimen Ridge again, but instead of trees, there were bones. Towering, bleached white bones, piled high as mountains, stretching out in every direction. And from beneath those bone piles, I'd hear it, scratching and snarling, trying to tear its way free. From somewhere, a voice would whisper, dry and raspy as old leaves, waiting, always waiting. Turns out, the creature wasn't done with me, not by a long shot. I'd walk into my cabin at night and find things, off. A book left open to a page I didn't remember reading, my gear rearranged ever so slightly. Then the footprints started. Found him clear as day in the mud by my porch one morning. Those same clawed prints, too big for any damn critter known to science. My breaking point came when I spotted it watching me from the edge of the woods near my usual patrol route. Even at a distance, I recognized the patchy hide and those eyes. They glowed with a cold, calculating light now, like it was playing with me, just waiting for me to make the next move. That's when I knew I had a choice, curl up in a ball and let the fear eat me alive, or go all in even if it meant getting myself labeled as officially crazy. I started digging, hitting up every resource I could find, ranger archives, the internet, even those nutjob conspiracy sites about strange phenomena. It took me down a rabbit hole that made the creature in the woods look downright normal by comparison. Turns out Yellowstone's got a hidden history, Tales whispered campfire to campfire. Stuff most folks dismiss as the ramblings of drunk tourists with overactive imaginations. But it started to fall into place. Disappearances over the centuries, explained away conveniently as wilderness accidents. Reports of strange creatures, dismissed as hoaxes, grizzlies with mange, you name it always just under the radar of official notice. The deeper I dug, the more I saw a pattern. Something's always been out there, hidden beneath the park's well-maintained surface. These creatures, they ain't just animals gone wrong. There's something, elemental, tied to the wild spirit of the place itself. Guardians, maybe, or the opposite, depends on who you ask. Whatever they are, one thing's clear, they don't like us messing with their territory. The final straw came a few days later. They found Emily, a seasonal ranger, bright-eyed kid with a love of botany, out near the mud volcano. What was left of her wasn't much to look at. Claws, teeth, that same damn stench clinging to the scene. Official report said bear attack, aggressive boar gone rogue. I went out there myself, off the record, saw the truth, the savagery of it. That did it. I wasn't gonna let that creature, whatever it was, keep hunting my people. I put in for leave, said I needed time to cope with Emily's death. They gave it to me. The worried looks amplifying that unspoken this guy's gone off the rails vibe that clung to me like a bad smell. Didn't care. I used the time to gear up, not just ranger gear. I hit pawn shops, hunting stores, any place where a man desperate enough might find what he needs. Silver bullets were a long shot, but hey, the stories say werewolves, so gotta cover the bases. Then, one night when the moon hung heavy and full, casting strange shadows over the park, I went back to Specimen Ridge. Part of me hoped the creature wouldn't show that I was well and truly crazy, chasing nightmares. 
But deep down, I knew better. Didn't even bring the flashlight this time. Just me, the rifle, some old-timey charms I picked up from a native reservation trading post, and a belly full of reckless determination. I waited at the heart of that petrified forest, the silence thick enough to choke on. The moonlight turned those bone-white trees into monstrous shapes, and my heart, traitorous thing, did its damnedest to leap out of my chest. But then, a flicker of movement in the shadows, those damn eyes like dim emeralds. It moved cautiously this time, the assault back on the trail burned into its memory. I raised the rifle, voice steadier than I felt, and said, Look, we can do this the easy way, or the hard way. Your choice. Silence. Then that raspy, rustling voice whispered from the darkness. Not in words, not like you and I talk, but something older, echoing in the back of my skull. Anger, hunger, and a strange, calculating patience that told me legends of long lifespans might hold some truth. You think you can stop me, little ranger? I've watched your kind come and go like mayflies. This place is mine. The words formed in my mind, heavy like stones. Maybe, I said, thumbing back the hammer on the rifle, the sound echoing like a gunshot in the stillness. But I bet I can make you bleed before you go. The creature hissed, the sound slithering over my skin, raising goosebumps. Then it charged from the shadows, not a lumbering bear charge, but a blur of claws and teeth and ancient rage. I fired, again and again, the rifle bucking in my hands. I saw those silver rounds connect, tearing through its unnatural hide. It howled and I could swear I heard surprise mingled with the pain. The charm around my neck, a woven bit of eagle feathers and bare claws, felt like it was burning into my skin. The creature staggered, then lunged again, and I swear, in that split second, it grew, its shape twisting into something even less recognizable, less bound by the laws of biology as humans know it. I dodged felt its claws tear a gash down my side. Smelled that sour rot smell stronger than ever. I scrambled back, fumbling for another charm, a pouch of bitter herbs and graveyard dirt. I ripped it open, flung the contents directly at the creature's face. It screeched, a sound that cracked the night in two, reared back. I could see the fear then, the raw surprise that something as insignificant as me was not just resisting, but pushing back. And just like that, it turned and vanished into the darkness, leaving a trail of foul-smelling smoke in its wake. I slumped against a petrified tree, slick with blood and sweat, and something that wasn't quite relief. The battle was won, for now. But the war, I knew had only just begun. The aftermath, like I said, was tragic. They found me half delirious the next morning, patched me up, wrote it off as an exceptionally vicious animal attack. I kept my mouth shut, knew better than to try and explain the truth. Officially, I went on extended medical leave. Unofficially, I think every ranger in Yellowstone knows I ain't never coming back. Took up a new life off the grid, up north where the woods are deep and cell reception is a luxury. Every night, I check the wards I've laid, a mix of old lore and new tech, motion sensors, cameras, you name it. Every day, I train marksmanship, wilderness survival, the old ways of fighting things that don't show up on wildlife identification charts. Because I'll be damned if I let that creature, or any of its kind, hurt anyone else on my watch. Sometimes, I dream of those bone piles, hear the scratching under the earth, and that old, 
raspy whisper telling me I can't hold it back forever. Maybe I can't, but damn it, I'll die trying. Let me tell you straight up, never take a job at Olympic National Park during elk rotting season. City slickers flock to see those majestic beasts clash antlers, me, I'm usually stuck cleaning up their half-eaten subway sandwiches and dodging hormone-crazed bulls twice the size of my pickup truck. My name's Toby, park ranger for eight years and counting, mostly because nothing much worse than an ill-timed case of food poisoning ever seems to happen in those old-growth forests. Well, I was wrong. See, it wasn't that I never heard the stories. Every grizzled old-timer has a tale or two about things in the woods you don't see on any tourist map. Even a few of the native reservation guys warn you to watch your step. But hey, bears and cougars, I got protocols for those. Whatever was out there this year, it wasn't playing by the usual rules. First, it was the missing hikers. Two guys, experienced outdoorsmen by all accounts, vanished up the Bogachio River Trail like they were smoke on the wind. Search and rescue went in, combed every inch for a week. Turned up nothing but a shredded backpack and some blood, too high up a tree to belong to a bear. The whispers started then, something big, something strong. Something that could walk on two legs, but wasn't human. Folks dismissed it as just that whispers. Then I saw the tracks. I was on litter patrol out by the whole river when I stumbled across them. Not bear, not wolf, nothing I recognized. Five toes, way too big for a man's print, clawed embedded deep in the damp earth like whatever made them was twice my weight. Next to the prince, half crushed beneath one enormous foot, was a mangled park radio. That's what sent chills down my spine. We ain't exactly swimming in funding, and a busted radio miles from cell reception meant whoever broke it did it easy, like snapping a twig. I reported the tracks and the radio. Got some concerned looks, extra patrols promised, official recommendation to always work in pairs. They were taking it seriously, but also like they weren't taking it seriously enough, if you know what I mean. Bureaucracy, even when lives might be at stake. That was two weeks ago. Now it's the height of elk mating season, and I'm partnered up with Rosalind, a rookie fresh from training. Sweet kid, good head on her shoulders, but damn, the timing couldn't be worse. The bull elk were already riled, the air thick with musk and the clash of antlers. I tried to keep us to the main trail, clear of the thick undergrowth where you never know what might be lurking. Didn't do much good. We were nearing one of those mossy, fern-covered groves tourists love when the smell hit us. Not rotten meat, thank God, but something musty and wet, like old carpet and a locker room mixed together. Rosalind scrunched her nose. I didn't like it one bit. We inched forward, rifles ready, and that's when we saw it. The beast was hunched over an elk carcass, freshly killed, the stag's proud rack digging into the dirt. It was massive, easily eight feet tall if it stood upright, but fur clung in patches to its grayish skin, revealing knobs of bone and taut muscle. Its arms were freakishly long, tipped with black claws longer than my fingers. And its head, twisted, elongated, with the muzzle stretched too far, and eyes, glowing dull green in the shadow, that tracked our every move. It wasn't a bear, wolf, nothing I had ever seen before. Deep down, some primal part of me screamed that this thing wasn't even natural. And then it let out a sound I'll never forget, 
a whistling snarl that echoed through the ancient trees. Rosalind, run! I yelled, but before she could even turn, the beast lunged. It moved with impossible speed, a blur of claws and teeth. There was a scream, cut short, then the sound of bones snapping, and something wet splattered my face. I scrambled backwards, fumbling for my rifle, my heart pounding so hard I thought it had burst right through my ribs. When I dared to look up, the creature was gone, vanished back into the trees, leaving only the half-eaten carcass and Rosalind's shredded pack lying in what was left of her. I don't remember much after that, adrenaline and shock, I guess. Somehow I made it back to the station, babbling like a madman. I could see in their eyes, the other rangers, they thought I'd snapped. Maybe I did. They called for backup, the works, state troopers, even a biologist specializing in predators. They found the elk, the prince, but nothing else. No sign of Rosalind, like the damn thing dragged her off to wherever it came from. They gave me a week off, said it was mandatory stress leave. Fat lot of good that did. All I could see when I closed my eyes was that monstrous shape, those glowing, soulless eyes, and Rosalind's face just before. I tried to drink the nightmares away, but the musty fur smell clung to the stale air of my apartment. Sleep was impossible. My dreams turned into twisted hallucinations, visions of the creature watching me from the shadowed corners of the room its claws clicking on the floorboards. I jumped at every creak, every rustle of leaves beneath the window. When I went back, the whole place felt different. The park HQ simmered with an unspoken tension. Whispers followed me in the hallways, and I swore some of the rangers flinched when I was near them, like I was somehow tainted by what happened. Even the forest seemed to hold its breath around me, the usual chirp of birds and rustle of leaves replaced with chilling silence. The whispers twisted then, said I was cursed, blamed me for bringing that thing into our territory. They assigned me to desk duty, signing the shrink's report and the tremor in my hands. Fine. I didn't want to be out patrolling anyway but I couldn't just sit back knowing that creature was still out there, maybe stalking some unsuspecting family come to enjoy the beauty of the Olympics. When the brass wasn't looking, I dug through every damn record the park had, old reports, legends scrawled on yellowed paper, blurry photographs dismissed as hoaxes. My obsession gnawed at me, but I couldn't let it go. Then, I found it buried in a stack of files from the 60s, a barely legible incident report. Logging camp up north, whole crew vanished overnight, and those left behind swore they heard inhuman screeching coming from the trees. Accompanying the report was a sketch, crude, but chillingly familiar. The same elongated head, the freakish proportions of the limbs. The biologist, Dr. Warren, was my last hope. City suit type, more comfortable analyzing scat than facing the reality of what lived in the woods. At first, he scoffed, muttered about mass hysteria and misidentified animals. I slammed the report down on his desk, told him about Rosalind. About the tracks, the smell, the way that thing moved and the eyes. He still looked skeptical, but there was a flicker of unease in his expression too. Listen, I pleaded, desperation making my voice hoarse, something's out there. Big, unnatural, and it's smart. It's hunting. It took Rosalind, and Christ knows, it could take more. We have to do something. Dr. Warren pulled at his collar the gesture uncharacteristically nervous. All right, he said slowly, let's say, 
Hypothetically, your creature exists. What do you propose? Standard protocol is to avoid conflict whenever possible. We ain't got that luxury. I shot back. This thing's a predator, probably territorial. It ain't gonna leave until we drive it out or... Or until it kills its way through every hiker, ranger, and elk stupid enough to cross its path. I didn't say the last part out loud. To my surprise, Dr. Warren met my crazed gaze with something that almost resembled determination. There might be a way, he admitted reluctantly, risky, unconventional, absolutely not sanctioned by the Park Service. But, it could work. Turns out Dr. Warren wasn't all lab reports and theories. He used to track poachers back in Africa, said they used a similar technique to flush out cunning predators. The plan was brutal but simple, bait. Rosalind's bright yellow rain jacket, her pack, her scent, we spread them around a clearing, me and Warren hunkered down in a makeshift blind of branches and ferns. The waiting was the worst. It was dusk when we arrived and deep night by the time we heard the first crackle of disturbed undergrowth. Every muscle in my body tensed. I couldn't tell if it was fear or anticipation, maybe a sick mix of both. We had one shot, one chance to lure it in, to get a clear look and decide how the hell we could even hurt the thing, let alone kill it. I gripped my rifle, fingers numb. The creature stepped into the moonlight, its hunched form stark against the silver glow. Up close, it was even more grotesque. Skin hung loose on its emaciated frame, and its stench was overpowering. But its eyes, those still held a terrible, calculating intelligence. It sniffed the air, zeroing in on Rosalind's things. Don't move, Warren whispered his breath a cold puff in the tense silence. His fancy camera, usually used for documenting rare birds, was now trained on the monster with grim purpose. The creature was cautious, circling the clearing instead of charging in. For a heart-stopping moment, I thought it might sense the trap, disappear back into the shadows. But then it let out a low, rasping growl and lunged, snatching Rosalind's jacket. It wrenched the fabric, tearing it apart, then reared back as if surprised, letting out an ear-splitting shriek of rage. Now! Warren barked, and I fired. The rifle roared, and the recoil slammed into my shoulder. The creature stumbled, the bullet tearing a chunk of flesh from its shoulder. It howled, an inhuman sound that sent shivers down my spine. And that's when it saw us. Its eyes flared with fury and recognition. I knew, right then, that we'd made a terrible mistake. This wasn't about bait and traps anymore, this was about revenge. It charged, moving with that same terrifying speed as it tore through the blind's flimsy concealment. Warren yelped and scrambled back, but I held my ground. I fired again and again, the clearing filled with smoke and the monster's echoing shrieks. I saw more bullets connect, ripping into its tough hide, but it barely seemed to slow down. Then I was out of ammo, the gun an empty weight in my hands. The creature lunged, claws outstretched. One swipe ripped across my chest, burning like fire. I staggered back, my vision blurring. That was it, this was how I'd end, next to Rosalind's torn shreds, the whispers proven right in the end. I braced myself for the killing blow. There was a flash of silver, and a guttural roar filled the night. Warren, holding a wicked-looking machete he must have stashed who knows where, had charged, swinging with surprising force. 
the honed blade bit deep into the creature's leg, severing muscle and sinew. It howled, stumbling, and for a second, its attention was diverted. Go! Warren screamed at me, his face streaked with blood, either mine or the creature's. I didn't need telling twice. I ran, stumbled, clawed my way back into the shadowed forest. Behind me, I heard the clash of blade against claw, Warren shouts, and the creature's enraged roars. I couldn't look back, just ran until my lungs burned and my legs gave out. I must have passed out. When I came to, it was dawn, blessed sunlight filtering through the leaves. I lay there aching, too exhausted at first to even check if I was still in one piece. Slowly, I sat up. My side throbbed where the creature slashed me, but the wounds looked shallow, more claw than a death blow. There was no sound from the direction of the clearing. I didn't dare go back, instead dragged myself towards the nearest trail, towards anything resembling civilization. It took me hours, crawling more than walking at some points, but I made it. A group of hikers found me, and, well, the rest is a haze of ambulances, frantic questions, and the growing realization that somehow, I was alive. Warren's gone. Search parties found no trace of him. We tell the world it was a bear attack, maybe a rogue grizzly. The truth, that ain't for tourist brochures. The creature might be wounded, might be dead, but something in my gut tells me it's still out there. I still smell its foul odor when the wind is right, and I've seen the tracks, those huge, clawed footprints by the river. Whatever it is, it won't forget. And neither will I. They never reopened the trail where I saw the beast, citing safety concerns. Unofficially, word spread through the ranger ranks. Some folks leave the service, others request transfers far, far away from the Olympic forests me. I got a nasty set of scars and nightmares that jolt me awake in a cold sweat. But damn it, this is my park, and I won't let that thing take it without a fight. I reckon everyone's got a spot that sets their teeth on edge, a place where the hair on the back of your neck stands up just that little bit straighter. For me, it's the Black Hills National Forest in South Dakota. Don't get me wrong, it's gorgeous, all pine trees and rugged cliffs, the kind of place tourists flock to with their fancy cameras. But there's something else there too, something old and watchful that ain't on any of those souvenir postcards. See, I'm a ranger, name's Dalton and I've seen things that'd make a city slicker's eyes bug clean out of their head. It started small, like most bad things do. A missing hiker here, a shredded campsite there. Nothing I couldn't chalk up to bears or mountain lions getting bold. Least, that's what I told myself at the time. Then the whispers started, stories passed between rangers, the kind we brush off with a nervous chuckle and a swig of too strong coffee. Stories about things glimpsed in the twilight, hulking shapes with too many teeth, eyes that burned in the darkness like embers. Problem is, the more I heard, the more it lined up with an itch in the back of my own mind, memories of half-seen shadows on my own patrols. That's how I found myself volunteering for a night shift near Jewel Cave, a place with an uneasy feel even in broad daylight. Figured if anything was out there, the cover of darkness might just give me a better shot at getting a clean look. The first few hours were quiet, just the usual symphony of crickets and the wind whispering through the trees. I was starting to think I'd spooked myself over nothing when the smell hit me. 
It was like a slaughterhouse and rotten eggs rolled into one. A stink so thick it damn near made me choke. Then I heard it, a rustling from deep in the undergrowth, heavy and purposeful. My hand went to my pistol on instinct, but my gut twisted with an icy dread. This wasn't any predator I'd ever encountered. A low growl echoed through the trees, a sound that vibrated right through my boots. Slowly, it emerged from the shadows. At first, I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. It was massive, easily eight feet tall at the shoulder, with glistening, hairless skin stretched taut across a skeletal frame. Its limbs were long and spindly, tipped with claws like chipped obsidian. But it was the head, that's what sent shivers down my spine. The head was long and tapered, the jaw jutting out at an impossible angle lined with rows of jagged teeth. Its eyes, they were wide and bulbous, reflecting the moonlight with a sickly green glow. The creature stared at me, its gaze chillingly intelligent. It wasn't just some dumb beast driven by hunger. There was malice in those eyes, a cold calculation that made my blood run cold. I froze, every survival instinct screaming at me to run. But some corner of my full brain wouldn't let my legs obey. It was like staring down a rattlesnake, part terrified fascination, part morbid curiosity about when the strike would come. The creature tilted its head, let out a low, rasping hiss that sent goosebumps rippling across my arms. That seemed to break the spell. I stumbled back, fumbling for the walkie-talkie clip to my belt. My fingers, clumsy with adrenaline, could barely get a grip. Dispatch, I choked out, voice hoarse, this is Ranger Dalton, requesting emergency backup near Jewel Cave. Unidentified creature, I repeat, unidentified. Then the creature was moving, not the lumbering charge of a bear, but a fluid, terrifyingly swift lope that closed the distance between us in seconds. I raised the pistol, unloaded a panicked volley of shots. They echoed through the night, but the creature seemed unfazed. One bullet grazed its flank, drawing a thin line of black blood, but it didn't even flinch. It lunged, and I swear time itself stuttered to a crawl. I saw those claws outstretched, heard the air rip as they sliced towards me. Desperation lent me a burst of speed, and I dove sideways, rolling frantically. The claws ripped through the air where I'd been a heartbeat before gouging deep furrows into the trunk of a pine tree. The stink of the creature's blood filled the air, acrid and overpowering. I was on my feet, scrambling, blind instinct driving me deeper into the woods. Behind me, I heard the creature give a frustrated screech, the sound echoing through the trees. It was too damn close. Every cracking twig, every rustle of leaves, sounded like its relentless pursuit. My breath sawed in and out of my lungs, my heart a frantic drumbeat threatening to burst from my ribs. Just when I thought my legs would give out, I saw a flicker of light up ahead. The old fire lookout tower. Maybe, just maybe, if I could get up there. Hope flared, hot and desperate. I pushed myself harder, branches whipping at my face, the creature's snarls a constant soundtrack in my ears. The base of the tower loomed ahead. I fumbled for the ladder, my numb fingers slipping on the cold metal rungs. Come on, come on, I muttered, the words lost in the pounding of my pulse. I pulled myself up, half climbing, half falling onto the small platform. The ladder was flimsy, swaying with my weight. Below, I heard the creature circling, growling in rage. My hands shook as I fumbled with the rusted hatch, 
finally yanking it open and scrambling inside. I slammed it shut just as the creature rammed the tower's base. The structure shuddered under the impact, and I let out a strangled cry. I was trapped here, just a flimsy wooden box between me and, and whatever that thing was. Desperately, I scanned the platform. An old oil lamp, a coil of rope, or rusty axe. Worthless against what lurked below. Then something glinted in the corner, half hidden under a tarp. A flare gun. I snatched it up, heart thudding with renewed hope. Maybe I couldn't kill the creature, but if I could signal for help. I fumbled with the catch, hands slick with sweat and fear. Outside, the creature roared, the sound shaking the tower to its core. I could hear the splintering of wood as its claws ripped into the supports. Time was a fist clenched around my throat, every second a brutal countdown. I finally managed to release the flare gun's safety, my fingers trembling violently. I aimed it out of the small window, the creature's grotesque form a writhing shadow in the moonlight. With a silent prayer that this gamble wasn't as foolish as it felt, I squeezed the trigger. The flare fired with a whoosh, arcing into the night sky and exploding in a burst of brilliant red light. The sudden brightness threw the clearing into sharp relief, casting long, distorted shadows. For a moment, the creature seemed startled, blinking its bulbous eyes against the glare. Then it let out a shriek that pierced the night, rage and pain twisting in its echoing cry. I fumbled for another flare, but my clumsy fingers dropped it. It clattered uselessly against the platform floor as the creature regained its footing. With renewed fury, it launched itself at the tower again. The impact made the whole structure groan and sway, and I cried out as I was thrown against the wall. The wood around the base of the tower was cracking ominously. It wouldn't hold for long. I had one shot left, one desperate chance to signal for help before those rotten timbers gave way. My stomach churned. What if the flare was missed in the darkness? What if help didn't arrive in time? I grabbed the last flare, my breath ragged in my throat, and shoved it out the window. The creature was practically clawing its way up now its skeletal form a nightmare against the dying light of the first flare. I pulled the trigger, and the second flare shot upwards, bathing the scene in a harsh light. And then, silence. The creature froze, its clawed hand inches from the platform, its hideous head turned towards the sky. Hope surged through me, hot and reckless. Had someone seen the flares? was rescue on its way. I didn't dare let myself believe it fully, but the creature had paused its relentless attack. It snarled, a low rumble filled with frustration, then turned and slunk back into the shadows. The tower swayed precariously as its weight shifted, but it held. I slumped against the wall, every muscle screaming in protest, and let out a shuddering sigh of relief. I might just have bought myself some time. Hours must have passed, the night a blur of terror and the desperate hope that those flares hadn't been in vain. Every creak of wood, every rustling in the forest below, set my heart pounding like a trapped bird against my ribs. As the first gray hints of dawn began to lighten the sky, I heard it, the sound of distant sirens. I choked back a sob, a wild mix of relief and bone-deep exhaustion washing over me. Help was coming. It looked like I might just survive this. The sirens grew louder, and through the trees, I saw the flashing blue and red lights of emergency vehicles. Rescue teams spilled out, armed and tense, 
their shouts cutting through the pre-dawn stillness. Scrambling down the ladder felt like moving underwater, my limbs sluggish and unresponsive. But the moment my boots hit the ground, and a fellow ranger rushed over to check me over, something snapped in my exhausted mind. I started babbling, about the creature, its size, its eyes, the smell. They exchanged concerned looks, and a medic gently led me towards an ambulance. The aftermath was a mess, exactly as you'd expect. The story of my encounter spread like wildfire. There was an official investigation, search parties combing the forest, every bit of the tower and surrounding area scrutinized. They found the creature's tracks, the gouge marks on the trees, enough evidence to confirm I hadn't lost my mind entirely. But the creature itself? Vanished. As if it had dissolved back into the shadows from which it came. They told me I was lucky called me a survivor, offered counseling, time off, all the standard things. But I could see it in their eyes, the lingering doubt. It was an easy narrative for them, ranger in shock, mistaking a familiar animal in the darkness, mind playing tricks after a traumatic event. Maybe that was even partially true. But deep down, I know what I saw. And I know that out there, in the quiet places where the world still holds its secrets, it's still waiting. News crews descended on the Black Hills, turning the whole thing into a circus. Some hailed me as a hero, others whispered about backwoods hallucinations and tainted moonshine. The official report called it an encounter with an unknown predator a convenient explanation that left enough ambiguity to settle the public's nerves. But those of us who patrol the woods, who see the things that make tourists snap those idyllic photos and move on none the wiser, we know better. They wanted me to go back to work like normal, pretend none of this had happened. Like after facing down something out of a nightmare, I could just clock in, file reports, and reassure scare hikers. I tried, I really did, but every rustle of leaves had me flinching. My dreams were filled with those glowing eyes and the reek of rotten meat. One morning, I woke up, looked at my uniform hanging on the back of my door, and I knew I couldn't do it. Handed in my resignation. They gave me sympathetic looks, talked about the benefits of therapy. Seemed easier for them to think I'd cracked under pressure than to accept that maybe, just maybe, the things that go bump in the night are a little more real than we want to believe. Left the Black Hills in my rearview mirror, trying to put some distance between myself and the shadows that clung to that place. Found a small cabin up in the main woods, Figured if anything monstrous was going to find me, better it be something with too many teeth and a taste for lobster than whatever stalked those South Dakota pines. Took up odd jobs, carpentry, trail maintenance, anything to stay busy and under the open sky. Even got a dog, a big, goofy mutt with a bark that could probably scare off a grumpy bear. It ain't a perfect life, and sometimes, lying awake at night, I still hear the echo of talons scraping against wood and smell that sour rot. I jump at every unexpected sound, and I've taken to checking the tree lean more often than is strictly healthy. But it's a calm sore of fear now, manageable. Because the truth is, those old stories, the campfire tales whispered from generation to generation, they exist for a reason. I learned firsthand that the line between the world we know and the one just beyond the edges of our maps is mighty thin. And sometimes, under the right, or horribly wrong, circumstances, that line gets crossed. I figure the best I can do is keep watch, keep myself sharp and be grateful for every new sunrise.
The rest, well, I leave that up to the creatures in the dark. If anyone ever tells you there's nothing scary about the Ozarks, tell them about my time as a ranger in the Mark Twain National Forest and they might think twice. City folks picture it all gentle hills and fishing holes. Me, I know better. Those old woods hide things, shadows deeper than the hollers. Things most people are lucky enough never to see. My name's Wyatt, by the way, and this is how I learned that lesson the hard way. It started the summer I was assigned to the remote Bell Mountain wilderness. Now, wilderness ain't just a fancy word out there, means no paved roads, no cell reception, just you, the trees, and whatever else might be lurking in them. The locals, the old-timers with flinty eyes and faded overalls, they'd warn us rookies, something out there in Bell Mountain. Something ain't right. I chalked it up to superstition, tall tales to keep tourists on the beaten path. Turns out, sometimes the old-timers know what they're talking about. The first sign of trouble came a few weeks in. Routine patrol, checking for illegal campfires and the usual litter bugs, when I stumbled across a deer carcass. Not just dead, but savaged. Half-eaten, ragged holes torn in its haunches. No bear or cougar would do that. Their kills are clean. Fuhrer buzzed in the back of my skull, that primal prey instinct screaming something was wrong. Radio calls back to HQ went unanswered. Damned spotty reception out there, figures it chose that moment to fail. I kept on my route, but my senses were on high alert, rifle in hand instead of slung over my shoulder. Every rustle in the underbrush, every snapping twig, made me jump. Night fell like a shroud. The Ozarks go real dark, real fast, that thick canopy swallowing all but pinpricks of starlight. I made camp in a small clearing where a creek gurgled nearby, the sound a poor substitute for human company. Couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. Figured I was just spooked, so I forced myself to build a small fire, the crackle and light offering some semblance of normalcy. I must have dozed off, because I jolted awake to an unholy sound. It was something between a howl and a scream, ragged and guttural, echoing off the hillsides. My campfire had burned low, leaving the clearing cloaked in ominous shadows. Another scream, closer this time, made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Panic surged through me. I fumbled for my flashlight, it's been cutting through the darkness like a weak, pitiful sword. That's when I saw them, a pair of eyes glowing in the darkness at the edge of the clearing. Not the yellow-green of a predator, but a bluish-white that seemed to bore into my very soul. Fear momentarily paralyzed me. Then, the creature stepped into the firelight, and my world tilted on its axis. It was tall, too tall for any bear or cat I'd ever seen. Its body was emaciated, ribs protruding from taut, hairless skin that was a sickly pale color. Its head, it looked almost human at first glance, but horribly twisted, the skull stretched and malformed, the mouth a gaping maw filled with far too many teeth. Its eyes, those eyes held a chilling intelligence, a hunger that had nothing to do with animal instinct. This was something far older, far more cunning. I choked back a scream and raised my rifle, more out of a desperate need to do something than any hope of it having an effect. The creature hissed the sound like nails on a chalkboard, and lunged. I had just enough time to fire off a shot before it slammed into me, knocking me flat on my back. The rifle flew from my grasp, skittering into the darkness. 
Pain exploded in my shoulder as the creature bit down, its ragged teeth tearing through my jacket, but thankfully not finding much flesh. The smell that washed over me was pure rot, nauseating and overpowering. I wriggled, bucked, anything to dislodge it. The thing was strong, impossibly strong for how scrawny it looked, but desperation fueled me. My hand found a half-buried rock and I swung it blindly, feeling it connect with a sickening crack. The creature shrieked, its grip loosening for a split second. I scrambled free, stumbling backwards toward the gurgling creek. A ragged, gurgling sound pursued me. The creature was hurt, but not out of the fight. I turned and ran blindly, branches whipping my face, my boots splashing through the frigid creek water. Thorns tore at my clothes, my lungs burned, but the terror was a relentless engine driving me onward. I don't know how long I ran. I burst from the woods into another clearing, this one bathed in the pale glow of dawn. I was gasping for breath, covered in mud and blood, when I saw the blessed sight of a dirt road and a beat-up old forest service truck parked haphazardly nearby. A figure emerged from the woods on the other side of the clearing, the creature. It watched me, the bluish glow of its eyes flickering in the half-light. Then, slowly, it turned and retreated back into the shadows from whence it came. I never saw that thing again. The official report chalked it up to a bear attack, but the rangers who found me could tell I'd seen something that didn't fit their neat understanding of the world. I quit soon afterwards, couldn't bear the sight of those ancient woods any longer. I drive trucks for a living now, sticking to well-lit highways and populated rest stops. Sometimes, though, I catch a glimpse of some dark, forested mountain range out of the corner of my eye, and a cold shiver runs down my spine. Because some corners of the world are better left untamed, some shadows are better left undisturbed. And out there in the Ozarks, amongst the old trees and the echoing hollers, I know something still lurks, waiting for the next fool to underestimate the wild. They patched me up at a rural clinic, mumbling about miraculous escapes and overly enthusiastic young rangers. The doctor gave me a hefty dose of painkillers and strict instructions to see a therapist as soon as I got back to civilization. PTSD, they said, though I knew the shrink sessions wouldn't erase the memory of those glowing eyes and that fetid breath. Going off the grid was supposed to help, hole up in a rundown motel room somewhere, drown my nightmares with cheap whiskey and forget the feel of gnarled claws tearing at my shoulder. Didn't work. That damned creature haunted my every waking moment. I'd see it reflected in grimy windows, hear its ragged breathing in the rustle of the AC unit. I jumped at every creak of the floorboards, rifle at my side even though I was miles from the nearest wilderness. Weeks turned into a blurry haze of paranoia and self-loathing. I was drowning, sinking beneath the weight of unseen horrors. Then, one night, I stumbled across a website, barely functional and hidden in a far corner of the weirder side of the internet. A forum full of half-baked conspiracy theories, blurry photos of unidentified creatures, rambling stories from folks who sounded as unhinged as I felt. But among the madness, a few threads mentioned something eerily familiar, the Ozarks, disappearances, a creature like a man twisted into a nightmare. It was a lifeline, twisted and frayed as it was. I clung to those stories, the shared misery offering twisted comfort in the knowledge I wasn't alone in seeing the unseeable. I spent days obsessively combing through the posts, finding accounts that stretched back decades, 
back to when those Ozark hills were even wilder and less trodden. A pattern emerged, fragmented though it was, glimpses of the creature, isolated attacks, people, rangers, hikers, even whole damn families, vanishing without a trace. No one connected the dots officially, but the forum folks, those touched by the darkness like me, they knew. That's when the determination kicked in, a bitter, angry twist of the fear that had been eating me alive. I wasn't just going to survive, I was going to go back and end this. Loaded up on weapons, both the conventional and the less than legal kind, I stocked my beat up truck with supplies. There was a recklessness in me, a desperate need to settle the score. The drive brought me back to the edge of the Bell Mountain wilderness. I parked well off the beaten track, hid the truck as best I could. This wasn't an official operation, they'd lock me up if they knew what I was about. This was about vengeance, and maybe some twisted kind of redemption, a chance to prove I wasn't just some coward who got lucky. I spent the first few days scouting, relying on the old ranger skills that hadn't quite atrophied. The Ozarks felt different, the air charged with a waiting malevolence. I set up a hidden camp high in the hills, overlooking the expanse of dense forest land. And I waited. For three nights, nothing happened. The isolation gnawed at me, the silence punctuated by every rustling leaf setting off alarm bells in my head. On the fourth day, as the sun began to dip below the horizon, I saw it a flicker of unnatural movement near a gully several ridges over. It was there and then gone, melting into the shadows like it was never there at all. But I knew. It was haunting. Adrenaline surged through me, drowning out the residual fear. I gathered my gear, rifle, night vision goggles, a heavy hunting knife I'd bought off some survivalist not online and a silver flask, filled to the brim with good Kentucky bourbon, both for courage and in case things went south. The descent into the gully was slow, treacherous in the dwindling light. With each step, the forest seemed to close in, the deepening twilight casting grotesque shapes on the gnarled trees. My breath came in ragged gasps as I strained my ears for any sound every muscle tense and ready for attack. Then I smelled it, that rotten meat musk, stronger this time, almost overpowering. Up ahead, a flicker of movement near a tangle of fallen trees. The creature's bluish eyes pierced the gloom, reflecting the dim light of my headlamp. My heart pounded in my chest, but beneath it was a primal surge of fury. This thing, it took a piece of me, left me broken and haunted. Now, it was payback time. I raised my rifle and fired, shattering the silence. The creature let out a piercing shriek and reared back. I charged forward, not even thinking about tactics, driven by pure, desperate intent. It lunged again, and I barely dodged the swipe of its wicked claws. My next shot grazed its emaciated side, and I saw a spurt of bluish blood. It snarled, a terrifying parody of a human expression twisting its skeletal face. We circled each other, predator and prey rolls blurring. I got another shot off, hitting it in the leg. It stumbled, and I seized the opportunity, lunging forward with my knife. The blade sank into its side with a sickening squelch. It screamed, the sound echoing through the trees, and lashed out blindly. I was knocked sprawling, my rifle flying from my grasp. I scrambled to my feet, my ribs aching, just in time to see the creature charging through the undergrowth. Hurt, but not finished. Cursing, 
I stumbled after it, following a trail of blood droplets and disturbed vegetation. Then the trees opened into a clearing, the one where I'd first encountered the beast. In the center, illuminated by a sliver of moonlight, stood an ancient, gnarled oak, its roots like grasping claws tearing into the earth. And at its base, a gaping maw of a cave, an impossible darkness amidst the mossy rocks. The creature was limping towards it, seeking sanctuary. I couldn't let it escape. Drawing on reserves of strength I didn't know I had, I sprinted forward, the bourbon fueling reckless fury. I reached the cave entrance just as the creature disappeared into the gloom. It whirled, eyes burning with malevolent fury. I barely had time to raise my knife before it lunged, its ragged claws glinting in the pale moonlight. And then, there was just pain, searing agony as its claws ripped into my side. I screamed, more enraged than fear, and slashed wildly with my knife. We tumbled to the ground in a tangle of limbs, a grotesque ballet of predator and desperate prey. Then, with a final desperate lunge, I plunged the knife deep into its chest. A gurgling, choking sound, and then silence. The creature lay still, its bluish eyes dimming, finally lifeless. A wave of nausea washed over me, mingled with a shuddering, gasping relief. It was over. I lay there on the cold stone floor of the cave, blood mingling and sticky on the ancient rock, the smell of iron sharp in the air. And all I could think was, I should have listened to the old timers. Sometimes the wilderness ain't meant to be tamed, sometimes the darkness wins. I've always loved the Great Smoky Mountains. That blue haze hanging over them, the feeling like you could get lost in those ancient forests for a hundred years and still not uncover all their secrets. Me, I'm Wyatt, park ranger for the past eight years. I've been on countless search and rescue missions in these mountains, seen some things that still give me the chills, but this... This story makes all that feel like a walk in the park. It started around three weeks ago, towards the end of summer. We got a call from a frantic hiker who had been camping out near Abrams Falls. Said his wife had vanished, that the campsite was trashed and there were, well, let's just say some unsettling details that didn't fit the usual bear attack pattern. They'd heard weird noises, too. Since it was already getting dark, there wasn't enough time to do a full-blown search. I told him to stay put, seal up the tent best he could, and me and another ranger, Amelia, headed out to join him by morning. The next day, we reached the man, whose name was Elston. He was a jittery mess, poor guy. His story was wild, all those strange noises at night a high-pitched screech he swore wasn't from any animal he'd ever heard, and then, just before sunrise, a shadow moving near the tree lean. He said it was big, fast, but he couldn't make out any details in the dark. When we entered the campsite, I could understand his fear. It was a disaster, tent ripped open, supplies strewn everywhere, and unsettling streaks of blood. The only thing missing was a body, or even signs of a struggle, for that matter. It was like his wife had just disappeared into thin air. Amelia and I split up to survey the area. I found some odd tracks near the edge of the clearing, deep impressions unlike anything I'd seen before. And that chilling screech Elston described echoed through the woods again, closer this time followed by a sound I can only describe as a cross between a snarl and a broken laugh. Something was out there, something that didn't match any of the predators in these mountains. I radioed Amelia, 
told her to stay put until I caught up. But my radio signal cut out mid-sentence, the static growing as I moved deeper into the woods. By now, I was on high alert. It felt like I was being watched, every snap of a twig making me jump. I decided to try and get to higher ground, hoping to get better reception and a view of the surroundings. As I climbed the slope, a sudden stench hit me, a rotting, sour smell that made my stomach churn. And there, wedged between two boulders, was what remained of Elston's wife. It wasn't what you'd expect. The body was torn, mangled, like some giant animal had used her as a chew toy. But it wasn't the gore that made me lose my lunch, it was the way her limbs were twisted, bent at impossible angles like they didn't have bones. I forced myself to examine the remains, trying to be rational. There were huge claw marks on her torso, bigger than any bear, and bite marks so deep it was like her flesh had been scooped out. Just then, the screeching started again, this time right behind me. I spun around, but whatever made the sound was already gone. Shaken to my core, I stumbled back to the clearing, my hand trembling on my pistol. Amelia was nowhere to be found, only her backpack lying on the ground, as if she'd vanished just like Elston's wife. My radio was still useless, just buzzing static. Panic surged through me, a primal need to get out of there, but just as I turned to run, I saw it. At first, it was a blur of motion, leaping across the clearing. Then, it landed on a low-hanging branch just a few yards away, and my blood ran cold. It was tall, at least seven feet if it stood fully upright. Its body was lean, sinewy, covered in patchy, gray fur. But the head, that image is forever burned into my memory. Large, almost triangular, with a long, pointed snout and these flat, black eyes that seemed to look right through me. It bared its teeth, rows and rows of them, longer and sharper than any animal I knew of, in a grotesque grin. Lost, ranger, or raspy voice hissed from its impossibly wide mouth. I'd heard recordings of supposed monster sightings before, but always dismissed them as hoaxes or misidentifications. This voice, though, was chillingly real. It held an intelligence, a cruel amusement I couldn't comprehend. What are you? I choked out, my voice barely above a whisper. The creature tilted its head slightly, the grin widening. That, human, is the question, isn't it? Am I some new beast for you to label, to analyze? Or maybe something, older? It chuckled darkly, and my pulse pounded in my ears. It leapt down from the branch landing in a crouch. I instinctively raised my pistol, but I had no way of knowing if bullets would even hurt this thing. Why are you doing this? I tried to keep my voice steady, but a tremor ran through me. Doing, it echoed, amusement dripping from its tone. I'm simply playing, Ranger. It gets rather dull out here in the wilds, and you humans... Well, you're such fragile, entertaining things. Before I could react, it sprang, a blur of gray and fangs. I fired a shot into the air, more out of a desperate instinct than any hope of hitting it. But the sound seemed to startle the creature, making it pause just inches from my face. Its fetid breath washed over me. Those black eyes... It was like staring into two empty pits. I saw no reflection of myself in them, just endless, hungry darkness. The gunshot seemed to give me a moment's advantage. It hesitated, its head cocking to the side. That's when I made my move. I lunged, 
tackling the creature to the ground. It snarled, clawing at my chest, but I kept my grip. We rolled over and over, leaves and dirt flying everywhere. Then I felt a searing pain in my shoulder as it sank its teeth in. I let out a yell, pure instinct kicking in. I grabbed a fistful of its patchy fur and yanked. The creature howled and twisted, momentarily dislodging its grip on my shoulder. I scrambled to my feet. My gun lay somewhere in the undergrowth, useless now. I staggered backwards, clutching my wounded shoulder, my body aflame with agony. That screeching laugh echoed as it slowly rose. A long line of blood dripped from its muzzle. You got spirit, ranger, it rasped, that earns you a little more time to play. Fear was a roaring torn in my head, but beneath it was a flicker of defiant anger. Go to hell, I spat, my voice hoarse. It cocked its head, a playful cruelty flashing in those black eyes. Oh, I intend to, human. And I might even take you with me. Then it charged, not with the blinding speed from before, but like it was toying with me, giving me a sliver of a chance before tearing me apart. I turned and ran, not aiming for a particular path, just the instinct to put distance between me and that thing. My shoulder throbbed. It hampered my movements, slowing me down. I risked a glance back and saw the creature loping behind me, almost at a leisurely pace. Terror gave me a burst of energy, and I ran harder, weaving between trees. The woods were a green blur, the pain a constant, screaming presence in my body. Ahead, I saw it, the glimmer of the river through the thick undergrowth. Maybe, just maybe, if I could reach it. A root caught my foot, and I went sprawling. My knee cracked sickeningly against a rock, but I scrambled up, my breath ragged in my throat. I could hear the creature closing in again, that blood-curdling screech like a nightmare-given voice. I was so close now. I burst through the final curtain of leaves, onto the riverbank. The river wasn't wide, maybe twenty feet across, but the current was strong, fed by recent rains. I scanned the opposite bank, hoping to see a path, a sign of the nearby hiking trail that would lead me back to civilization. But all I saw was dense forest and the looming mountainside. A shadow fell over me. I turned in slow motion as the creature stepped onto the riverbank, its eyes fixed on me. Panic squeezed my chest, but beneath it, a desperate resolve sparked. My injured shoulder might as well have been on fire, my knee threatened to buckle with every shift of my weight, and the odds weighed heavily against me. But I wasn't going down without a fight. You like water then, human? The creature rasped, a sinister smirk playing on its monstrous features. Let's see how well you swim. It tensed, ready to spring, but as it did, I moved. I flung myself into the river. The shock of icy water sucked the breath from my lungs. The current caught me, wrenching me downstream. The creature screeched in fury. I heard it crashing into the river, the splash somewhere behind me. I struggled to stay afloat, the pain in my shoulder and knee making every stroke a torment. The shore blurred by as the current swept me along. My only hope was to reach a bend, a shallow spot, anything before. Then the river bed vanished beneath me. I was yanked downwards with terrifying force tumbling through the freezing depths. My lungs burned as I fought the current, trying to surface. But something had me, dragging me under, further into the darkness. Dimly, 
I saw a monstrous shape through the swirling water. The creature. Its claws were clamped on my legs, pulling me inexorably towards a black, jagged opening at the bottom of the river, a cave entrance, hidden from the surface. My lungs screamed. Black spots danced in my vision. Then, a sudden jolt, as my leg hit rock. The grip loosened just enough. With a final, desperate heave, I tore myself free and shot toward the surface. Breaking through, I gasped for air, choking water sputtering from my lips. I thrashed to stay afloat, but the current dragged me mercilessly onward. My shoulder was fire, my knee throbbing like a drumbeat. I couldn't go on much longer. Blackness crept into the edges of my vision as I started to lose consciousness. Then, a miracle, the riverbed rose, and the current slowed. Scrambling, more animal than human now, I reached the rocky shore and collapsed, gasping and retching on all fours. Lying there, listening to the fading roar of the river, it felt almost surreal. Had it all been a hallucination, a fever dream brought on by shock and wounds? But then I looked down at my ragged, blood-soaked clothes, felt the dull burn of my shoulder, the sharp twist of pain from my knee, and the truth was undeniable. It was real, every horrifying moment of it. And somewhere out there, that monster was still lurking. They found me near nightfall, a search team drawn out by Amelia's radio, which had somehow clicked back on. They were shocked to see me alive, and more concerned when I babbled about monsters and creatures from nightmares. But in their eyes, I saw the same pity I'd seen in the eyes of others, they thought I'd snapped under the stress and trauma. I was treated, questioned. The incident was explained away. Bear attack, hallucinations from blood loss. The standard playbook for the inexplicable. They kept me for observation, muttering about shock and psychological assessment. I knew what I saw, but how to prove what sounded like a creature out of a campfire horror story. In the end, they discharged me. I went back home a shattered wreck, the nightmares more vivid than reality. No one believed me, except, Elston. After some digging, I found him. He, too, was brushed off, labeled as suffering from grief-induced delusions. And just like me, he knew the truth. That creature is still out there in the wilds of the Smokies, maybe hunting, maybe just watching and waiting for another victim to play with. All I know is that I can never go back. It's taken part of me, not just my flesh, but something deeper. And sometimes, late at night, I swear I can hear that chilling, raspy voice in the wind, a taunting echo of a game I miraculously survived. See you soon, Ranger. I remember it like yesterday. Last July, I went on my usual patrol around the Black Hills National Forest. I know these trails like the back of my hand. Been a park ranger here for almost a decade now, and the most exciting thing I usually see are folks roasting marshmallows a little too close to the fire pit. My name's Wyatt, by the way. Don't get me wrong. I love a quiet day. It means nobody is causing trouble, the animals are safe, and I can get back to Sarah and the kids in time for dinner. But, man, sometimes it gets real dull out there in the endless rows of pines. Even the sound of a woodpecker hammering away can start to feel like nails on a chalkboard after a while. This day, things kicked off differently. It was the missing persons report plastered all over the station that had me on high alert. 
Caden Hughes, a 20-something hiker, vanished without a trace three weeks ago. We'd gotten leads, sure, some sightings around the northern trails, a discarded water bottle, but nothing solid. It was like the guy up and disappeared into thin air. Now, don't get me started on the weirdos around here. You got folks ranting about aliens, mountain lions the size of a bus, even rumors about some sort of Bigfoot-like creature. Most days, that's just background noise to me. But with Caden gone and the usual leads running cold, some of those crazy whispers started to poke at me. Not that I believe in space invaders or monster apes, mind you. It's just the not knowing, you know? That gnaws at a guy. After double-checking my gear and radio, I started on my patrol, a loop through the southern section of the forest. First couple of hours were uneventful. Birds chirping, sun filtering through the trees, hell, I even thought I'd treat myself to a little nap under an old oak tree. That should tell you how slow it usually is out there. I mean, who is going to go messing around in the woods when it's 90 degrees out and the mosquitoes are hungry enough to carry off a chihuahua? It was on the final leg of the loop, heading back toward the station as the evening started to set in, that things went all sorts of wrong. The forest, it felt, off. The shadows seemed a little too deep, the regular animal sounds eerily quiet. Not that I'm a superstitious guy, but you get a feel for the place after all this time. Then I heard it, a rustling from deep in the underbrush, just off the main path. It wasn't the scampering of some squirrel or rabbit, this was, bigger. I froze, hand hovering over my canister of bear spray. I started scanning the treeline, trying to pinpoint the source of the noise. And that's when I saw them. Two eyes. They were low, maybe just three feet off the ground, gleaming a dull yellow in the twilight. At first, I couldn't make out anything beyond that, just those glowing eyes hanging in the air. Then, a shape started to emerge from the shadows. At first, I convinced myself it was just a deer, a deformed one, maybe. But as it moved closer, the denial melted away. This thing, it was big, easily six feet tall, maybe more. It walked hunched over on two legs, but its arms were way too long, almost dragging on the ground. What the hell, its hands looked like claws. Big, wicked claws. It moved slow and deliberate, sort of swaying as it walked, but those eyes never left me. It's hard to describe the feeling that washed over me then. Kind of like a mix of ice water dumped straight into my veins in those times when you wake with a jolt because you swear you were falling. Part of me was screaming to get the hell out of there, but something else, I don't know, curiosity maybe, kept me rooted to the spot. The creature finally came to a stop maybe twenty yards in front of me, still shadowed by the trees. It just stood there, swaying slightly, those yellow eyes boring into mine. It was close enough then that I noticed other things. Awful details that still make my skin crawl when I think about them. Its coat wasn't fur, not exactly. More like coarse bristles, dark as night and clumped in patches with bare skin showing through. It was thin, too, ribs showing through its stretched hide. The smell that wafted off it was all wrong, sort of rotting meat mixed with a wet dog musk that made my eyes water. For what seemed like forever, we just stared at each other. But then, slowly, it raised one clawed hand and took a shambling step towards me. That's when I snapped out of it, survival instincts kicking in. I fumbled with the bear spray, ripping it out of the holster, thumb hovering over the trigger. 
back off. I mean it. I yelled, the tremor in my voice betraying my fear. The damn thing just tilted its head, like it was confused. It let out a sore of grunt hiss, then took another step forward. That's when I let loose, hitting it with a blast of the bear spray, a thick, orange cloud enveloping its head. I didn't wait to see the effect. I took off running, the noise of my fleeing footsteps swallowed by the silent forest. I don't know how long I ran, just that I didn't stop until my lungs were on fire and I collapsed behind a thick bush, heart pounding in my ears. I crouched there, catching my breath, listening for any sign of pursuit. But all I heard was the buzzing insects and the distant cawing of a crow. It was like the whole encounter had been some fever dream. If it wasn't for the lingering stench of pepper spray in my nostrils and the distant image of those eyes burned into my memory, I would have questioned my own damn sanity. I must have stayed hidden for a good hour, terrified that the creature would come bounding through the trees, snatch me up like those unlucky mosquitoes. Finally, as the last of the daylight faded, I found the courage to start back to the station. I was a mess, leaves and dirt tangled in my hair, my uniform in tatters. When I stumbled into the station, flashlight beam trembling, old Bill at the night desk nearly jumped out of his skin. Christ Almighty, Wyatt, you look like you saw a ghost, he stammered, eyes wide. Something like that, I managed my voice still raspy from the sprint and the lingering terror. Bill pushed a cup of lukewarm coffee my way and I took a shaky sip, the warmth doing little to soothe my frayed nerves. I couldn't get the creature's image out of my head. The way it moved, those eyes. I'd seen some messed up stuff in the woods over the years, but this? This was on another level. The next morning, after filing a report that even I knew sounded crazy as hell, a search party was organized. Bill, a couple of other rangers, and even a few volunteers combed the area where I'd spotted the thing. Now, I'm not the spotlight-loving type, so the attention made me uncomfortable. But if there was a chance of finding that creature, stopping it before it hurt anyone else, well... I'd swallow my pride. We found nothing. Not a footprint, not a strand of weird black hair. No sign of the creature at all. Bill gave me a long, scrutinizing look, like he was trying to assess whether I'd totally lost my marbles. It was a look I got a lot from the team over the following days. The whispers followed me too, Wyatt saw a monster, He's having a breakdown. Can't say I blame them. What made it worse was the news. Three nights after my encounter, another hiker vanished. Jacob Lynn, a college kid on a camping trip. Last seen on the Northern Trails trails close to where Caden Hughes went missing. My stomach twisted into knots. Had that thing I saw been the culprit? Was it snatching people from the forest, and was I helpless to stop it? The guilt ate at me, a constant, gnawing ache. I started pushing myself harder on patrols, spending longer hours in the woods, fueled by a desperate mix of fear and determination. Sure, some folks said I was going overboard, that the disappearances were just a tragic coincidence. But those yellow... Predatory eyes haunted my dreams, a testament to the true danger lurking out there. Then came the night that shattered everything. It was a routine night patrol. Sarah had made meatloaf, my favorite, so I was itching to get home. Stupid, in hindsight. Complacency is a killer out in the woods. That's the thing I'd always drilled into those rookie rangers. The forest, 
She doesn't care if you just want to clock out and go home. I stopped by an old, half-collapsed ranger cabin I hadn't checked in on for a while. It was in a remote clearing, one of those spots that always gave me a prickle at the back of my neck, even in broad daylight. Should have listened to my gut. I heard the noise before I even opened the cabin door. A low, wet growl that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. It was coming from inside. I drew my gun, slowly easing the creaky wooden door open, muscles tensed and ready. The stench hit me first, that same sour meat and musty fur smell that clung to the memory of the creature. Inside the cabin, illuminated in the weak beam of my flashlight, was a scene of carnage. Blood was everywhere, splattered across the floor and walls, dark and sticky against the warped wood panels. In the center of the room, amidst the gore, was Mike. Or rather, what was left of him. Mike Johnson, one of the newer rangers, a damn good kid with a bright future ahead of him. His body was, torn is the only way to describe it. His face was frozen in a mask of terror, one eye gone, the other staring vacantly at nothing. My stomach heaved, but I forced it down, searching for any sign of the culprit. Nothing. The damn thing had vanished again, leaving nothing but carnage and unanswered questions behind. My mind screamed denials, it couldn't be real, it shouldn't be real. It couldn't be the same creature. No animal could do this. I stumbled back out of the cabin, hands shaking as I fumbled for the radio clip to my belt. My voice broke as I choked out a call for backup, the words barely audible through the static and the pounding of my panicked heart. Help arrived faster than I'd expected. Bill was in the lead, his face a mix of grim determination and concern for his shaken comrade. The crime scene techs swarmed the cabin, their flashes of light slicing through the dark. The whispers started instantly, the ones about me being cursed, bringing a monster into our woods that was hungry for my ranger buddies. They never found the creature. Despite search parties scouring the forest for weeks after Mike's murder, there were simply no traces, no clues. It was like a malignant shadow swallowed him whole, leaving only the bloody aftermath. For months, a constant, suffocating fear hung over the Black Hills. Trails closed, patrols doubled. We were a community on edge. Rangers carrying rifles instead of binoculars. But the creature never revealed itself again. Some folks say it moved on, that it found a new hunting ground. Others, and Bill is among them, think it's still out there, biding its time in the forgotten corners of the forest. Whatever the truth, I feel its presence. In the unnatural silence of the trees, in the flicker of shadows at the corner of my eye. Me, I handed in my resignation a few weeks after Mike. Couldn't face those woods any longer, not with the weight of his death on my shoulders. Sarah understood, always did. We packed up the kids and moved to the city. Took a security gig guarding some fancy office building. Doesn't pay great, the air smells of stale coffee, and even the pigeons here give me the side eye. But it's safe. No endless rows of silent trees. No piercing yellow eyes glowing in the dark. Some nights, though, lying in our tiny apartment, the traffic a distant rumble, I still see that creature. The sway of its walk, the hunger in its eyes, that god-awful smell and I wonder how many more sleepless nights I've got ahead of me. I never should have taken that assignment in Sequoia National Park. 
You city folks, you hear that name and think of those photo ops, the impossibly huge trees and cute little bears begging for trail mix. Well, let me tell you, those parts tourists see are like Disneyland compared to the real Sequoia. Deep in the backcountry, the forests ain't so cuddly, the trails ain't so pretty, and the things lurking in the shadows, those ain't getting paid to smile for your camera. My name's Everett, by the way, was a ranger there for seven years before things went to hell. It started innocuous enough, a standard missing persons report. Experienced hiker, a loner named Nathaniel, overdue from a two-week trek in the remote northern wilderness. Nothing too unusual, folks get turned around, break an ankle, whatever. Protocol is protocol, though, so me and another ranger, Amelia, headed out to sweep the area. That first day was uneventful, almost boring. Nathaniel's trail was faint, and we found zero indication of anything beyond the usual misplaced nature enthusiast. The backcountry sequoia forest gets thick, real quick. Ancient trees, canopy so dense it blots out the sun, and undergrowth like a tangled, humid mess. That night we made camp in a small clearing and Amelia, bless her heart, tried to lighten the mood. Maybe Nathaniel's just off having a spiritual moment with a big O.L. sequoia and forgot to tell anyone, she joked. I couldn't muster much of a laugh. See, I'd heard whispers among the old timers about that part of the park. Something unsettling, some old echo from way before the trails and ranger stations. That feeling of being watched, that prickle down your spine like something ain't right with the world, it settled on me like a cold mist. Morning came, and the search continued. Hours of bushwhacking, turning up nothing. The forest played tricks with sound, the rustle of leaves mimicking footsteps, the snap of twigs making you flinch. Amelia kept up the cheerful chatter, but by mid-afternoon, even she was subdued. Then we found it, a shred of Nathaniel's pack, the bright blue nylon a jarring contrast against the browns and greens of the forest floor. Beside it, a patch of trampled undergrowth, and a single sneaker, ripped to pieces like some giant, angry dog had gotten hold of it. There was a faint stain on the ground, could be mud, could be something darker. My stomach clenched. Whatever this was, it wasn't an accident. We radioed it in, the response crackly with tension. A full search and rescue team was scrambled for the next day. Me and Amelia were told to stay put, secure a perimeter. We set up camp right there, an uneasy, jumpy night punctuated by every whisper of the wind. That's when we saw the eyes. Just beyond the flickering edge of our campfire, two glowing orbs low to the ground, reflecting the light. Too small to be a bear, too steady to be a deer. I swear, they stared at us with a chilling intelligence. The next morning felt different. The air hung heavy with a strange anticipation, like the calm before the mother of all storms. The search and rescue team arrived, six men and women in crisp uniforms armed with tracking tech and those grim, professional faces that say they've seen things they'd rather forget. I pointed out the shredded sneaker, the gleaming eyes in the darkness. The grizzled team leader, Harrison, just kinda grunted. Old timer, probably heard the same ranger rumors I did. We split into search parties, combing through the dense woods like a fine-toothed whatever. I ended up paired with Aisha, a rookie ranger fresh out of training. Her eager face and textbook search techniques were almost comical out there in the primordial gloom. Hours went by, the tension growing thicker with each empty patch of forest. 
Aisha tried to chat, bless her heart, about safety protocols and de-escalating wild bear encounters. It was like a nervous squirrel trying to hold a conversation at a death metal concert. Finally, we stumbled into a ravine, choked with tangled ferns and fallen moss-covered logs. Aisha was about to mark it clear on her GPS unit when I heard it, a rustling from beneath a half-rotted trunk. Then, a low growl, the kind that vibrates in your bones more than you hear it. Aisha, behind you. I yelled, just as a shape hurled out from under the log. Fast, impossibly fast, a hunched blur of dark fur and glistening fangs. Before Aisha could even scream, it was on her, knocking her down in a tangle of limbs and flailing gear. I aimed my rifle, but the whole thing was too chaotic, and I knew a stray bullet could hit Aisha as easily as whatever that thing was. I charged, slamming the butt of my rifle into the creature's back. It snarled, whipping its head around. For a second, I saw its face, and a wave of icy terror washed over me. It was like a dog, but wrong, its muzzle too long, its jaws gaping too wide. And the eyes, Lord, those eyes, a hateful yellow that burned into my soul. The creature lunged again, but Harrison and his search team stormed into the ravine, guns raised. A volley of shots rang out and the creature yipped, disappearing into the undergrowth with uncanny speed. One of the rangers, a young guy named Ben, knelt beside Aisha. He swore under his breath and yelled for the medic. Aisha's leg was torn open, the bright red of blood a sickening splash against the drab forest floor. Turns out, those gnarled claws weren't just for decoration. They got Aisha airlifted out, the wop-wop of the helicopter fading against the backdrop of the Sequoia Giants. The rest of us were left to pick up the pieces, both literal and otherwise. The ravine was a mess, trampled plants, discarded gear, and patches of blood that looked too dark against the rich soil. And there were tracks paw prints far larger than any bear or mountain lion I'd ever seen, sunk deep into the mud where the creature had fled. Harrison's face was grim as he collected the evidence. No more dismissive grunts now. Whatever we were dealing with, it was real, it was dangerous, and it was still out there. We finished the ravine sweep, the remaining daylight hours feeling oppressive despite the cooling air. Whatever that thing was, it left a sour taste in the world, like the air before a nasty electrical storm. Camp that night was subdued. Nobody tried to crack jokes around the fire. It was like something fundamental had broken in us, some innocent trust between us and the wild that couldn't be fixed. The rangers huddled closer together, the campfire a weak shield against the vast darkness of the forest. I couldn't sleep, my mind replaying that snarling dog-like face, the hungry glint in those glowing eyes. I thought about Nathaniel, wondered if he'd seen the same thing, right before the end. Morning came too fast, harsh sunlight cutting through the trees exposing the grim aftermath of yesterday's attack. We were supposed to resume the search, but fear hung over us like a shroud. Finally, Harrison cleared his throat, listen up, folks. There's something, different out here. Standard protocols, they ain't gonna cut it. He outlined the new plan, tighter search grids, no one goes off alone weapons ready at all times. There was an unspoken agreement in his eyes, if that creature showed itself again, we weren't holding back. The next two days were a blur of adrenaline and encroaching dread. Every rustle of leaves, every snapped twig set nerves on edge. 
I move like a damn robot, scan, walk, scan, walk, every muscle poised to fight or flee. The forest warped around me, no longer just trees and dirt, but a stage set for something monstrous waiting in the shadows. It messed with your head. That kind of constant tension ate away at you until you weren't sure if you were the hunter or the hunted. Then, on the third afternoon, hell broke loose. I was on the western edge of the search grid with Ben, the rookie who'd tended to Aisha. We were moving uphill, fighting through a particularly nasty patch of thorny scrub. I heard Ben curse, a sharp, Pain sound a moment before a blood-curdling scream pierced the air. I sprinted towards the sound, branches whipping at my face, my heart a frantic drum in my chest. I found Ben crumpled at the base of a massive sequoia, its roots like gnarled claws reaching for the sky. He was clutching his stomach, bright red staining his uniform. And above him, perched on a low-hanging branch, was the creature. Its fur was the color of storm clouds, mottled with patches where the skin was taut over prominent bones. Its head twisted at an unnatural angle, those yellow eyes gleaming with sadistic hunger. It hissed, revealing rows of needle-sharp teeth that dripped with Ben's blood. It dropped from the branch, landing soundlessly on the mossy ground. I leveled my rifle, screaming something incoherent and rage-fueled as I squeezed the trigger. The clearing filled with the roar of gunfire, the recoil jolting my shoulder, but the creature was a blur, zigzagging with inhuman speed. I caught glimpses of it dodging between trees, my bullets tearing through leaves and bark. Then, Ben screamed again, a choked, gurgling sound. Whipping around, I saw the creature crouched over him, its clawed hand buried deep in his side. With a roar that ripped from my gut, I charged bayonet fixed, plunging the blade into its flank. The creature screeched, a sound that made my skin crawl, and whirled to face me. Ben lay still, mercifully unconscious, but I knew in my bones it was too late for him. Rage and despair warred inside me. I was no hero, just a ranger with a bit of training and a whole lot of terror, but in that moment, I didn't care. The creature stalked closer, its yellow eyes locked on mine. It saw me, recognized me from the ravine, and there was a twisted sore of satisfaction in its gaze. This was personal now. This thing had tasted ranger blood, and it wanted more. I roared again, raising my rifle like a club, and charged. I knew it was reckless, stupid even, but I couldn't let Ben's death go unanswered. The creature lunged, and we collided in a chaos of snapping teeth and flailing limbs. Its claws raked across my chest, burning like fire. My boots slipped on the root-strewn ground, and we tumbled in a tangle, rolling down the slope. I slammed into the trunk of a redwood with a sickening thud, pain exploding in my ribs. The creature snarled, yellow eyes inches from mine. A wave of hopelessness washed over me. I was outmatched, overmatched in every way that mattered. Then, through my blurred vision, I saw something, the silver gleam of Ben's dropped pistol, half buried in the decaying leaves. Summoning a final surge of strength, I kicked out, knocking the creature back just enough to scramble towards the gun. My fingers closed around the cold metal. I rolled, leveling the pistol at the creature. It watched me, head cocked, a flicker of something like curiosity in its monstrous eyes. And I fired. Again and again and again until the gun clicked empty and my vision dissolved into a haze of pain and exhaustion. Silence fell, 
broken only by my ragged gasps for breath and the distant echo of shouts, the other rangers, responding to the gunfire. The creature was gone. Somewhere in the back of my battered mind, I knew they'd find Ben's ravaged body, a trail of blood marking where that thing had disappeared back into the unforgiving embrace of the forest. They'd find me, too, probably airlift me out like they did Aisha, patch me up, and send me home a broken piece of a man. Because that's what happens when you poke the darkness lurking in the old, deep parts of the world, sometimes it pokes back. And sometimes it doesn't let go until it stains the green and brown with your red and takes that hungry, yellow-eyed gleam a little bit deeper into the wild with it. I never expected my cushy summer gig at Denali National Park to turn into some sort of real-life horror movie. Then again, if I'm being honest, Alaska has always had a touch of the wild and otherworldly about it. I'm Elian, by the way, ranger here for the past two summers. Before you ask, no, I never saw Moose charge a tour bus, though the stories are legendary round these parts. What I did see, though, well, let's just say it makes those moose tails seem as quaint as a petting zoo. It started with the missing hikers. We get a few cases every year, folks who underestimate the wilderness, stray from the trails usually, they turn up within a day or two, humbled and sheepish with maybe some nasty bug bites. But this was different. Three disappearances within a month, all on the southern slopes of the McKinley Massif. Experienced hikers vanished without a trace. No abandoned gear, no distress calls, nothing. Now, Denali ain't your average national park. This place is vast, untamed. A raw, humbling reminder that nature is utterly indifferent to some dude in a REI fleece. But even with that in mind, something wasn't adding up. Rangers started patrolling the area in twos, an unspoken unease rippling through our ranks. I was paired up with Vanessa, a seasoned ranger with native Alaskan ancestry. She knew the land, not just the trails and the peaks, but the deeper currents, the old whispers that lingered in the vast expanse of the tundra. I'd always written that off as respectful superstition, but the grim set to her jaw made me reconsider. Our third day in the Massif area started like any other, overcast sky, crisp air carrying the scent of pine and something wilder underneath. Then, Vanessa stopped dead in her tracks, eyes fixed on a patch of moss at the trail's edge. Footprints, she said, her voice barely louder than a whisper. At first, I saw nothing. Then, with a prickling dread, I made them out, massive imprints, too wide for any bear I knew. But the strangest part, they were bipedal. Like something huge walked upright through here, something with feet shaped disturbingly close to ours. Dread settled in my gut like a cold stone. We radioed it in, voice shaking more than I cared to admit. The higher-ups sent a team to investigate, but warned us to keep it under wraps in the meantime. Didn't want to spook the tourists, you see. The higher-ups, always thinking about the bottom line even when folks' lives might be at risk. Me and Vanessa, though, we weren't so sure this was something we could just sweep under the rug. Word spread through the ranger network faster than a wildfire. Nobody wanted to go near the southern slopes. The tourists, blissfully unaware, snapped selfies with distant mountain vistas, oblivious to the growing tension among their protectors. Me and Vanessa, we requested a transfer, figuring better to be cowards than the next to disappear. But the request got held up in bureaucracy, and somehow, 
we ended up being assigned to an overnight patrol near that same damned area. It was just past dusk, the sky bleeding into a bruised purple, when we heard it, a guttural roar that echoed through the mountain passes, a sound that had no place in the natural world. Well, the natural world as we understood it. Goosebumps rose on my arms, and even Vanessa, with all her calm practicality, went pale. That's when we saw it emerge from a stand of spruce trees, a hulking silhouette outlined against the fading twilight. At first, in the dim light, I thought it was a grizzly standing on its hind legs, massive even for these parts. But as it lumbered closer, the details clicked into sickening focus. Its body was lean and hairless, the skin stretched tight over bone, a sickly grayish color. Its head, it was like a human skull stretched and warped into a grotesque parody. Tiny eyes gleamed a dull red in the sunken sockets, and when it opened its jaw, I saw rows of jagged, uneven teeth, far too many for any predator I knew of. My ranger training, drilled into me until it was muscle memory, momentarily took over. I fumbled for my rifle, but Vanessa grabbed my arm. No, she hissed, it won't do anything. Run. We ran. Even with the adrenaline fueling me, I could hear it gaining fast, its ragged breaths echoing through the stillness. Stumbling and scrambling, I risked a glance back. It was running on two legs, its elongated arms swinging low, claws glinting in the moonlight. Vanessa, usually fleet of foot, was falling behind. Keep going, she yelled over her shoulder, her voice strained. I didn't want to, but some primal survival instinct kicked in. I tore my eyes away and kept running, the pounding of my heart matching the thudding of its footsteps behind me. Then, I heard Vanessa scream, a sharp, terrible sound that abruptly cut off. Sobbing for breath, I burst through the tree line and onto a rough dirt access road. A ranger maintenance truck sat just ahead, keys still in the ignition. I didn't think, just jumped into the driver's seat and fumbled for the keys. My hands were trembling so badly it took three tries to get the damn thing into the ignition. The engine roared to life, and I slammed the truck into gear tires spitting gravel as I sped off. Headlights cut thin beams through the inky blackness. I didn't know where I was going, just that I needed to get away, put as much distance between me and that thing as I could. It was a damn miracle I didn't swerve off the road and wreck the truck in those first frantic moments, my whole body thrumming with terror. It was a good ten minutes before I could even force myself to look into the rearview mirror, half expecting to see a monstrous shape bounding after me. There was nothing. Just the empty road and my own ragged breaths echoing in the silence. The shock began to recede, replaced by a bone-deep sickening horror. Vanessa. Gone. Snatched into the darkness her fate a terrifying unknown. That creature, whatever the hell it was, it wasn't just some animal gone rogue. There was a predatory cunning in those eyes, a twisted intelligence that made my skin crawl. I drove through the night, fueled by desperate terror. The radio wouldn't pick up any stations out there in the wilderness, just a low hiss of static. I tried not to think about what awaited me back at base camp, the questions, the accusations, the looks of pity and thinly disguised doubt from fellow rangers. I knew how it would sound, a rookie ranger panicking, losing his partner out in the wild. They'd say it was a bear attack, maybe a freak accident. Maybe they'd even believe it, at least officially. But the ones who ventured into the true wilderness, the ones like Vanessa, 
they'd know better. As dawn broke, I reached the park's outer perimeter. Shafts of sunlight cut through the trees, seeming impossibly normal in contrast to the monstrous night I had endured. I stumbled out of the truck, legs nearly buckling under me from exhaustion and the crushing weight of grief. Back at the ranger station, it was chaos. Search and rescue teams were gearing up, grim-faced and bristling with weaponry. Sobbing, I told them everything, the footprints, the creature, Vanessa's scream. It felt like I was speaking a different language, the words hanging in the air, met with a mixture of shock, disbelief, and a flicker of something like fear. They called in specialists from Anchorage, folks from the Fish and Wildlife Department who supposedly dealt with the type of stuff park rangers weren't allowed to talk about. They interviewed me for hours, their questions sharp and relentless. I told my story until my voice was raw, until all that was left was a numb hollowness inside me. I saw the doubt in their eyes, even when they were trying to hide it. The head specialist, a grizzled dude named Jensen, seemed to believe me more than the others, or at least, he was smart enough to know there was no good explanation for Vanessa's disappearance. Over the next few weeks, I became their reluctant guide, leading them into the heart of the massif, to the place where the footprints appeared, the place where Vanessa had vanished. We found nothing. No trace of the creature, not a single hair or claw mark to prove my story. The search parties combed every inch of the mountains but came back empty-handed. Whispers started, the words break down and hallucination tossed around like stones meant to wound. My fellow rangers started avoiding me, the same folks I'd shared campfires and bad jokes with now only offered nervous smiles and quick exits. The guilt gnawed at me. Maybe it was my fault. Maybe if I'd tried to fight, maybe if I hadn't run. I crushed those thoughts with ruthless determination. What could I have done against that thing? Jensen found me at the edge of the park one evening, as the long Alaskan twilight stretched shadows across the land. He didn't offer comforting platitudes or the fake, pitying smiles like the others. Instead, he handed me a faded photograph. It was grainy, taken from a distance, but the creature in it was unmistakable, the same loping gait, the emaciated body, the skull-like head. Sierra Nevada Range, 1982, Jensen said, his voice gravelly, for hikers disappeared. One survivor. He met my gaze with a weathered stare. You aren't crazy, kid. That night, after too many beers in a dive bar near the park entrance, I made a decision. I put in a formal resignation letter with the park service. Cited exhaustion, mental health, some generic reason that wouldn't get me blacklisted from other ranger jobs entirely. Truth was, I couldn't bear the sight of those mountains anymore couldn't walk the trails knowing what lurked in the shadows. A few months later, I stood outside a nondescript government building somewhere in the lower 48, the bland concrete and polished glass in stark contrast to the wildness of Alaska. Jensen had pulled some strings, gotten me a meeting. Inside, a room full of men in suits waited, their eyes sharp beneath the fluorescent lighting. They were the type of folks who dealt with the things that got swept under the official rug, the things that didn't make the news. They listened to my story, stone-faced and dispassionate. When I was done, when the silence stretched into an unbearable length, one of them finally spoke. We'll be in touch, Mr. Varga, the man said, his voice smooth and noncommittal. As I was ushered out, I caught glimpses of other photos pinned to a board in the corner of the room, blurry figures, 
half obstructed but chillingly familiar. This wasn't just about Denali, not by a long shot. I never heard back from them. Some days I tell myself it was all a nightmare fueled by grief and rookie ranger jitters. Other days, I check the news for reports of missing hikers in national parks across the country. I'd like to say I moved on, got a normal job, maybe started a family in some safe suburb. But that would be another lie. The truth is, I drift from place to place, working the kinds of odd jobs under the table jobs that don't ask many questions. My senses are always on edge, scanning crowds for a flash of those malevolent red eyes. I don't sleep much, and when I do, it's with a hunting knife I keep under my pillow. Some nights, I dream about Denali, about Vanessa's scream, and I wake in a cold sweat to the sound of my own ragged breathing. They say time heals all wounds. But there are some wounds left by things that don't have names, by creatures that defy all the rules we set for the natural world. Sometimes, in the empty silence of a cheap motel room, I wonder if they're out there looking for me, those that hunt in the shadows between park signs and welcome brochures. And if they are, I can only hope I'll be ready this time. Okay, I get it, backpacking alone after my brother died probably wasn't the smartest move. People kept saying I needed closure or some crap like that, and there was something about the solitude of the woods that seemed to call to me. The Appalachians felt like the right place to try and heal. My brother, Kellen, he had always loved hiking out here. My name's Twyla, by the way. I'd been on the trail for almost three days. It was hard, and, yeah, maybe a little more emotional than I had planned for. But something about the crisp air and the smell of pines was slowly bringing a spark of life back to me. By the third afternoon, the ache of grief was beginning to dull into a manageable throb. Now, I'm not one for all that forest spirits stuff my brother used to ramble on about. But the deeper I trekked, the more primal the woods felt. The trees seemed to crowd in, their branches tangled like grasping fingers. Even the usual birdsong was replaced by eerie silence. That late afternoon, the setting sun cast long, strange shadows through the forest. Maybe a bit of hiker paranoia was setting in, but it felt like I was being watched. By the time dusk was falling, it was undeniable, something wasn't right. It started with the rustles and snaps of branches way too heavy to be just squirrels. An owl hooted, the sound weirdly low and grating. Then there was the smell, like a wet dog, only fouler, with a sickly sweet tinge that almost made me wretch. My hackles were well and truly raised by now. I decided to make camp early, open fire, plenty of light, and my bear spray at hand, just in case. Getting the fire going was harder than it should have been, though. The wood seemed damp despite the dry weather. Once the flame finally caught, the smoke billowed thick and white, choking me even though the wind was calm. That's when I saw it. Peeking from behind a giant oak, not more than twenty feet away. A pair of eyes, shining a dull amber color in the firelight. They were huge, and set way too narrow on a head that looked, wrong. Too big for a deer too squat for any predator I could think of. With a jolt of terror, I realized, those eyes were fixed on me. I fumbled for my bear spray, but in my panic, I dropped it. I turned to run, but something cracked behind me. Whipping around, I saw it emerge from the shadows. The creature was monstrous. 
It stood twice my height, powerfully built, hunched over with massive, clawed hands reaching the ground. Its fur was matted in patches, revealing gray, leathery skin. But the head, I can still see it in my nightmares, a long, tapered snout, filled with jagged teeth, and those two close, black button eyes, filled with a chilling intelligence. It took a shuddering step forward, and I finally broke from my frozen horror, scrambling backward. The creature let out a sound that was half snarl, half laugh, or raspy echo in the silent forest. Finally, it wheezed, its voice a grotesque parody of a human's. We haven't had a visitor in such a long time. I was vaguely aware of the absurdity of a talking monster, but abject terror overrode any logic. I tripped on a root, slamming into the ground hard. My ankle flared in agony, but adrenaline jolted me upright again. The creature was closing in, unhurried, as if savoring this. I offer a game, it rasped, getting closer. All you have to do is survive. With a cry, I scrambled towards the fire, ignoring the shooting pain in my ankle. I snatched a burning branch and swung it wildly at the creature. At first, it seemed startled, recoiling from the flames. Then, its lips curled in a hideous grin. Clever girl, it croaked. Fire. Very clever. But how long will it last? My heart sank. It was intelligent, cruel. This wasn't some animal. It wanted to play with its prey. The creature was advancing again. I hurled the burning branch and bolted past it, back into the trees. Maybe if I could just get to the trail, find another hiker, but my bad ankle was slowing me down. I could hear the creature easily moving behind me, the cracking of branches under its heavy steps cutting through its raspy taunts. Where are you running to, little one? There is no one to help you out here. Despair surged over me. He was right. I was utterly alone with this thing. Then a surge of defiance ignited within me. If I was going to go down, it wouldn't be some cowering victim. I stopped and turned to face the creature as it burst through the trees. If you want me then come get me. I'm right here. I yelled, trying to steady my ragged breathing. The creature tilted its head. Feisty little creature, it rasped. Very well then. It charged. I dodged to the side at the last minute, but it was shockingly fast. Its claws raked my jacket, tearing through the fabric, just barely missing my skin. I scrambled away, wincing as my ankle throbbed in protest. Panic fueled me now as I wove through the thick trees. If I focused on nothing but running, maybe, just maybe, but with each gasp I took, I knew I wasn't going to outrun this thing for long. Ahead, I saw it, a break in the trees, a sheer rock face glistening in the moonlight. A cliff. Not an escape, but it offered the slightest chance. My only option. I pushed myself harder, a desperate surge propelling me towards the edge. If I could somehow climb down or make a controlled slide, I might, well, I wasn't sure what. It wasn't a great plan, but it was literally the only one I had left. Behind me, the creature was gaining fast, its guttural snarl echoing through the trees. With a last burst of speed, I reached the cliff. I risked a split-second glance over my shoulder as I swung my legs over the edge, then scrambled down. The rock face was rough and unforgiving, scraping my skin, my fingernails tearing as I desperately sought holds. 
And then, I was falling. Whether I'd lost my grip or the cliff had simply crumbled beneath me was irrelevant. I tumbled through the air, bracing for the sickening impact, the crunch of breaking bones. But instead of the hard ground, there was a splash as I plunged into icy water. I was submerged, the sudden shock squeezing the air from my lungs. I fought my way to the surface, gasping, choking, utterly disoriented. The current was surprisingly strong, sweeping me in an unknown direction. I tried swimming, but my throbbing ankle and battered body wouldn't cooperate properly. I could only try to keep my head above water, to stay conscious. The roar of water filled my ears. There had to be rapids or a fall somewhere ahead. Exhaustion threatened to pull me under, and with a jolt of horror, I realized I was drifting closer to the opposite bank, the side where the creature still stalked. Panic renewed my strength. I flailed wildly, but the current was merciless. I was being swept straight towards the creature's domain and certain death. As the shoreline drew nearer, I could hear the creature's chilling snarl over the rushing water. It was scrambling down the cliff face, gaining with each second. I choked out a scream, more out of desperation than hope. But as the sound left my lips, a new sound cut through the night. Voices. Shouting. Flashlights piercing the darkness. There. By the river. Someone called. I blinked, barely able to discern shapes moving through the trees lining the riverbank. With one final surge of effort, I forced myself to yell again. Help. Over here. My voice was barely a croak but somehow, they heard. Suddenly, ropes were snaking through the air, splashing into the water near me. Adrenaline and raw survival instinct propelled my aching body. It took everything I had, but I managed to grab hold of a rope. Strong hands were hauling me out seconds later. I collapsed on the muddy riverbank, coughing and wheezing. A flashlight was shining directly into my eyes, and I tried to blink away the spots in my vision. Ma'am? Ma'am, are you all right? A worried voice asked. My vision cleared enough to see a young ranger kneeling beside me, concern etched across his face. The rest was a whirlwind. More rangers appeared, pulling me away from the river's edge. Someone produced a thick blanket and wrapped it tightly around me. The pain in my ankle was a roaring inferno now, and I started to shiver uncontrollably. All I could do was try to answer their questions, but words didn't seem to come out right, only disjointed fragments tumbling from my lips, creature, woods, teeth, eyes. They must have thought I was delusional, a victim of shock and exposure. And why wouldn't they? As the rangers gently bundled me into the back of their vehicle, I stole a glance back at the shadowed woods, a shiver running down my spine despite the blanket. I could have sworn I saw two amber eyes glinting in the darkness before the trees obscured my view. The rest of that night was a blur. Hospital lights, murmured questions a flurry of doctors and concerned faces. There were mumbled diagnoses, sprained ankle, various cuts and contusions, hypothermia, and something vague about PTSD. It all washed over me, the medical jargon mixing with the nightmarish events in my head. Eventually, I was discharged, left alone in a sterile hospital room with my ragged clothes and a hefty prescription of painkillers and sleeping pills. It was only then, after the chaos faded, that the enormity of what I'd survived hit me with crushing force. I collapsed onto the stiff hospital bed and sobbed, 
my entire body racked with uncontrollable tremors. My brother was gone. And I had almost been, too. I stayed in the hospital for two weeks. They tried to convince me to stay longer, for observation, for psychiatric evaluation. I refused. The idea of being confined any longer filled me with a fear that rivaled that night in the woods. What I needed wasn't therapy or a padded room, it was to get as far away from the Appalachians as possible. I never went back home, and I never returned to those woods. My belongings were packed and shipped to a tiny apartment on the west coast, a place as far removed from those haunted mountains as I could get. The physical scars eventually faded. My ankle healed, albeit with a persistent limp. But the emotional wounds festered, the nightmares leaving me twitching and bathed in sweat night after night. I couldn't hike, couldn't even stand to be alone near a cluster of trees without a wave of panic washing over me. People kept asking about the attack, assuming it had been a bear or some other wild animal. I couldn't say the truth. Who would believe me? I was labeled a survivor of trauma, told that eventually, the nightmares would go away. They haven't. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I wake up in a cold sweat and swear I can hear the rustling of leaves, the cracking of twigs. The rasping whisper echoes in my ears, I'll wait for you to come back, little one. My games have only just begun. I know it's out there, still lurking in the shadows of those ancient mountains. And, horrifyingly, I know, it's right. This nightmare isn't over. It's only a matter of time until it finds me again. Okay, I'll admit it, when they assigned me to Sequoia National Park for the summer, I wasn't thrilled. All those, well, giant trees, that's all. Boring. But look, I'm Wyatt, park ranger for six years now, and you don't get to pick your posts. Turned out, I might have been a little off in my assessment. Sequoia was beautiful, sure, in that overwhelming, old-growth forest kind of way. And it kept me busy enough, what with the usual litter bugs, off-trail hikers, and the occasional overly enthusiastic bear encounter to deal with. Then, about a month ago, things got weird. Like, way beyond your usual national park weird. It started with the missing persons reports. These weren't got lost and wandered off cases. These were experienced hikers, vanishing without a trace in broad daylight on well-marked trails. And there weren't any signs of, you know, the usual suspects, no torn up camps, no blood, nothing that would point to a mountain lion or a bear attack. Just, gone. Disappeared into thin air. One case really got under my skin. Couple on a day hike, vanished right on the grisly giant loop. Now, that trail is busy, packed with tourists gawking at the sequoias. I mean, come on, it's like disappearing in the middle of a mall on Christmas Eve. Someone would have seen something, right? The higher-ups sent a search team, obviously. Tore through the forest for days, found not a single damn clue. Then they sent another team, and another. The woods around here are big, so that's not totally surprising. But it cast this weird pall over the whole place. Tourists still came, but they were twitchy, watching the tree lean like they expected something to jump out at them. And the other rangers? Well, we mostly just avoided talking about it. But hey, that's what we get paid for, right? Handling the unpredictable. That night though, 
Things went from unpredictable to straight up bats hit crazy. I was on a night patrol near Tacopa Valley. Standard procedure, not that I really expected any trouble. But you gotta keep up appearances, plus there are always those yahoos starting campfires they shouldn't. The moon was bright, so I'd left my flashlight off, just letting my eyes adjust to the silvery light filtering through the trees. That's when I heard it, a rustling from deeper in the trees. Not a deer or even a squirrel, this was heavier, and moving with purpose. I stopped, hand on my sidearm. The rustling stopped too. Anyone there? I called, trying to sound more confident than I felt. Silence. My skin prickled uncomfortably. I slowly reached for my flashlight, flicking it on. At first, all it illuminated was a tangle of branches. Then, the beam caught two eyes glinting back at me, like dull green fire. My breath caught. It was. I don't know. Some kind of creature, but not anything I could name. The damn thing was huge almost as tall as me even though it was hunched over. Its body was lean and powerful, for mottled gray and brown like the bark of a sequoia. But it was the head, that image is forever burned into my memory. Long and tapered, not like a wolf but almost reptilian. Its jaw cracked open, revealing a maw of needle-sharp teeth that curved slightly backward. For a frozen moment, we stared at each other. Then, with a sound between a snarl and a hiss, it lunged. I barely managed to dive to the side and fire off a shot more out of instinct than anything else. The bullet pinged harmlessly off a rock, and the creature was already weaving between the trees with impossible speed. I scrambled to my feet, heart pounding. I fired off another shot in the general direction it had gone, but it felt feeble, just noise in that vast wilderness. It didn't come back. I stumbled back to my truck, hands shaking. Back at the ranger station, I filed a report that even I knew sounded crazy, unidentified creature, possible attack, etc. Reynolds, my superior, just gave me a concerned look and suggested I take a few days leave. I'm guessing my report is buried deep in some National Park Service file, labeled Ranger Fatigue or something. But I know what I saw. And what I heard later, in the dead of night, something scratching at my cabin window, whispering hisses just outside. Last week, I put in a transfer request. Yeah even if it's to some desert park with nothing but snakes and scorpions, at least those are monsters I can understand. I've seen what lurks in the shadows of those ancient trees, what preys on human beings like they're nothing more than squirrels. No way am I waiting around to be its next meal. The transfer came through way quicker than I expected. Like, suspiciously quick. Turns out those higher-ups are more than happy when a ranger decides the giant sequoias just aren't for them. It was fine by me. A week later, I was bumping across dusty roads in a park-issue jeep, leaving green forests behind for the scorching heat of Joshua Tree National Park. New place, new problems, I figured. At least out here. Everything that wants to kill you is scales or too many legs. And if something creepy did crawl out from under a rock, well, there wouldn't be any whispering forests to hide in. The desert is stark, brutal, but it keeps its secrets in plain sight, for better or worse. Or so I thought. Turns out, even the desert holds its own brand of darkness. After a couple weeks of the expected dehydration scares, cactus spine injuries, 
that one idiot who thought climbing a rock formation in flip-flops was wise, things started edging back into strange territory. Again, it began with the disappearances. A group of students on a geology trip, gone from their campsite. Their packs were there, their tents neatly zipped up, but no sign of the students themselves. This time though, there was something, else. Search and rescue found tracks huge tracks that didn't belong to a human or any known desert predator. Whatever made those prints had freakishly long strides that looked almost comical until you realized how quickly this creature must have covered ground. Worse, the tracks seemed to vanish in some areas, ending and then starting again, like the creature had simply flown away. Which was, I mean, ridiculous right? Things don't just sprout wings and, and that's when I started to get worried. Maybe that thing from Sequoia had followed me. Or maybe, my mind whispered in those sleepless desert nights, it wasn't just the one. Maybe there was a whole species of these monsters hiding in plain sight, picking off victims whenever the hunger struck. I tried to push it away, blame the heat stroke and the sleepless nights spent staring at the shimmering moonlit sands, waiting for shadows to morph into monstrous shapes. But then, I was assigned patrol on the Keysview route, a scenic loop that offers stunning views of the Coachella Valley. And I saw it again. It was perched on a rock outcropping, silhouetted against the blazing sunset. Same gnarled form, reptilian head, those teeth that would flash in my worst nightmares. The distance was too great for a good look, but the way it moved, it flowed, almost like a shadow detaching itself from the rock, then dissolving into the descending twilight. And those damn eyes, that dull green glow fixed in my direction even from so far away. I knew then. It knew I was here. It was playing with me, just like back in Sequoia. Nights were the worst. The desert gets deathly still after sunset. I'd wake up in my trailer, sweat drenched and gasping, phantom scratching echoing in my ears. Every rustle of wind became its guttural hiss, every creak of the trailer frame those impossibly long claws raking against the metal. My radio became my lifeline. I'd keep up a running commentary with the other rangers on duty, anything to fill the silence and pretend I wasn't completely alone out there. One night, it almost worked, until, mid-sentence, my radio went dead. Static crackled through the speakers, then nothing. Frantic, I tried reaching other stations, switching channels, but there was only that eerie silence. And outside my window, the sand looked wrong. Disturbed. Like something very big had recently shuffled past. With shaking hands, I grabbed my rifle. I hadn't trained for whatever this was, but I wasn't about to go down without a fight. The trailer creaked, a pressure against the wall that made the thin metal groan ominously. I heard the scrape of claws against fiberglass, the huff of fetid breath at the window. It was toying with me, basking in its power and my slowly unraveling sanity. Part of me wanted to throw open the door, just to get it over with. The other part, fueled by a desperate, primal urge for survival, made a plan. The jeep was parked about twenty yards away, the keys shaking in my clammy hands. It wasn't much, but it was my only option. I took a steadying breath, then flung open the trailer door and sprinted toward the jeep, the creature roaring behind me. I heard the splintering of wood as it crashed through the flimsy trailer. Fumbling at the door, I dropped the keys in the sand. They glinted mockingly in the moonlight. With a strangled sob, 
I scooped them up and dove into the jeep, slamming the door shut just as the creature impacted the driver's side. I started the engine, the jeep roaring to life almost in tandem with the creature's frustrated snarl. It battered the car, rocking it on its suspension. I slammed the gear into reverse, spinning the tires and sending up a spray of sand that momentarily obscured the creature. I stomped on the gas, the jeep lurching backwards as the headlights caught those gleaming eyes, then nothing but empty desert. I hit the brakes, put the jeep in drive, and took off, tires burning into the night. I must have driven for hours, finally collapsing in the parking lot of the main ranger station just after dawn. Somehow, against all odds, I'd escaped its clutches again. But as sunlight washed over the desert, turning the sands that muted gold, I knew it was a temporary reprieve. The creature was still out there, and it had a taste for me now. They sent a helicopter out the next day, found my demolished trailer, the creature's tracks crisscrossing the sand. My report was, well, even more outlandish than the Sequoia one, but I hardly cared. They shipped me out the following week, citing medical leave, a vague mention of severe stress. The doctors poke and prod me, ask about hallucinations and signs of mental breakdown. I let them. I'll take a diagnosis of PTSD over admitting there are creatures out there the park service doesn't acknowledge, things that defy every law of nature. Sometimes, when they leave me alone in this sterile hospital room, I can still feel the burn of those eyes still smell that rank animal musk even over the sharp disinfectant. And I know, deep down, it's not over. It knows where to find me. It's just a matter of time until it decides to finish what it started. Okay, let's face it. Being a park ranger at Glacier Pines National Park is usually as thrilling as watching moss grow. Don't get me wrong, I love this place, the sharp bite of mountain air, trees stretching taller than skyscrapers, the kind of quiet that makes your ears ring, it's paradise for a guy like me. My name's Ezekiel, by the way, but most folks around here call me Zeke. This whole mess started on a Wednesday in late July, hot as a frying pan even way up in the mountains. I was scheduled for my usual perimeter sweep, nothing out of the ordinary. The missus cooked me one of her amazing egg sandwiches and I packed an extra water bottle on account of the heat. Figured it'd be a good day for wildlife watching, maybe I'd catch a glimpse of that mama grizzly folks were whispering about. A couple of hours in, I came across a section of the trail ripped to hell. Claw marks gouged deep into the bark of a huge Douglas fir, long strips of wood hanging like some sort of messed up garland. Now, we get bears, sure, but this wasn't your regular bear scratching post. This was, bigger. Heavier. My hackles went up. I figured someone's dog must have gotten loose and had themselves a frenzy out here. Happens more often than you'd think, those designer doodle dogs from the city not quite built for the wilderness. I was scanning the trees for any sign of the pooch when I heard it, a rustling from deeper in the undergrowth, like something massive shifting its weight. My first instinct was bare. I reached for the bear spray on my belt, my heart thumping an uneven tattoo against my ribs. That's when it stepped into view. This thing, let me tell you, it was nothing like I'd ever seen before. At first, I thought it was a deer, but the shape was all wrong. It was tall, too tall for a deer, and spindly. When it shuffled further out of the shadows, I saw that it walked on two legs, 
but its arms dangled near the ground like an ape's. Its skin was bare in patches, like it had some kind of mange, the sickly gray flesh visible in the dappled sunlight. Its face, I'll try my best to describe it, but honestly, it's the stuff of nightmares. Its skull was small, stretched tight with skin, giving it a gaunt, skeletal look. The eyes were huge, sunken deep in their sockets, and they shone with a sore of dull, predatory hunger. But it was the mouth. God, the mouth. Too wide for its face and lined with rows of jagged teeth, like broken glass. I froze, the bear spray forgotten in my hand. Some primal survival instinct must have kicked in because my feet started moving before I made a conscious decision. I turned and ran. That damn thing let out a screech that sliced through the air, a blood-curdling sound that was equal parts animal and something worse, something utterly unnatural. It propelled me forward, running faster than I had since high school track meets. Branches whipped at my face, rocks bit into the soles of my boots, but I didn't dare look back. I don't know how long I ran. When I finally collapsed behind a fallen log, chest heaving, my legs were jelly. The only sound was the frantic hammering of my own heart. Slowly, the trembling subsided enough for me to try and make sense of what the hell I just saw. Was it some undiscovered creature? A genetic mutation gone terribly wrong? Maybe I was just hallucinating from heat exhaustion. I fumbled for the radio with unsteady fingers. My voice shook as I called it in, trying to describe the thing to dispatch. It felt ridiculous, like I had stepped right into some cheap horror movie. They thought I was having a breakdown, or maybe pulling a prank. Hell, I don't blame them. But deep down, I knew. That thing was real, and it was still out there. The rest of the day was a blur. Search parties were sent out, but they found nothing except the torn up tree, my word against the yawning emptiness of the forest. Over the next few weeks, things got real weird, real fast. Other rangers started whispering, saying they saw unsettling things too, shadows that moved too quickly, strange noises echoing through the canyons at night. And then, there was Harper. Sweet kid, new to the job, fresh out of the academy and so eager it made your teeth hurt. He vanished during a routine patrol on the North Ridge. Two days later, they found his backpack shredded, some, some remains that didn't add up to a whole body. There wasn't enough evidence for a conclusive animal attack report, and the higher-ups started muttering about accidents, about Harper getting turned around and falling from a cliff. But I knew. I knew that the thing I saw had gotten him. The guilt twisted my stomach into knots. It was only a matter of time before that creature got hungry again. I started carrying a rifle instead of just bear spray, a move that earned me some raised eyebrows from other rangers. But after what I saw, I wasn't taking any chances. Then, two nights ago, I got a call over the radio. Dispatch's voice crackled with urgency, reports of screams near Pine Creek Campground. My blood ran cold. Pine Creek was popular with tourists, families. I floored it towards the campground, my siren blaring a panicky warning into the night. I reached the campground in record time, heart slamming against my ribs like a trapped bird. The place had descended into utter chaos. Abandoned tents flapped in the wind, their contents spilled across the ground. Cars stood haphazardly, some with doors ajar, engines still idling. A child's bicycle lay overturned, its wheels spinning slowly. But there were no people. 
just an unnerving, echoing silence. I grabbed my rifle, moving cautiously between the deserted campsites. The back of my neck prickled, an almost unbearable sense of being watched. The beam of my flashlight cut through the gloom, revealing more signs of a hasty exodus, a half-eaten bag of marshmallows, a discarded sweater snagged on a branch, a forgotten stuffed animal lying face down in the dirt. The screams echoed again, louder this time, choked with terror. They were coming from a thick cluster of pines at the far end of the campground. I steeled my nerves and charged towards the sound, my boots crunching on stray pine cones. The trees closed in around me, their dense branches blocking out the moon and shrouding me in an inky darkness. That's when I saw it again. The creature. Hunched beneath the low-hanging branches, its grotesque silhouette sharp against the faint moonlight filtering through. It was tearing into something with savage intensity. I heard a wet, ripping sound, then a chilling whimper cut short. My stomach lurched, but I raised my rifle, my hands slick with sweat. I don't know if it sensed me, or if it was simply startled by the movement. It spun around with unnatural speed, its eyes gleaming like predatory embers in the dark. Before I could take aim, it lunged. Time seemed to distort, everything reduced to a blur of motion and adrenaline. I fired off a shot, more out of instinct than precision. It let out a piercing shriek, a wounded animal's cry that reverberated through the trees. Then, in a blink, it was gone, disappearing into the undergrowth with impossible agility. I charged after it, stumbling over roots and rocks, my breath ragged from fear and exertion. Branches tore at my clothes, the dense pine needles obscuring my path. I knew this was stupid, reckless. But there was a primal rage burning through me, a desperate need to stop this thing before it hurt anyone else. The chase led me into a narrow ravine, moonlight barely cutting through the thick canopy overhead. My flashlight had been knocked loose in the chase, leaving me in near darkness. Then I saw them eyes glinting back at me, not two this time, but half a dozen pairs scattered through the dense shadows. My heart sank. This wasn't just one freakish creature, it was a whole pack. The realization hit me with the heavy certainty of a boulder to the chest. They'd been watching us all along, hunting, picking us off one by one. I fumbled to reload my rifle, but fumbling fingers and a trembling body made it impossible. A guttural snarl rose from the darkness. A large shape burst forth from the shadows, charging directly towards me. Instinctively, I raised the rifle and fired again, but I knew I'd missed. The thing slammed into me with bone-jarring force, knocking me to the ground. Pain exploded in my shoulder as sharp teeth sunk into my flesh. I thrashed wildly, but its grip was like a vice. I tasted my own blood, a coppery tang filling my mouth. The world spun a kaleidoscope of dark shapes and those piercing, hungry eyes. I let out one last desperate scream, echoing through the ravine. Then, silence. They found what was left of me the next morning. Or rather, what the creatures left behind. The official report blamed a bear attack, maybe even a whole group of them acting abnormally. But those who examined what remained, those who saw the puncture marks in my bones too wide for any bear, too chaotic, they knew some darker truth lurked behind the sanitized report. They never found the creatures. The hunts, the patrols, they all turned up nothing. It was like they disappeared back into the same shadows they came from. 
the only proof of their existence was the trail of shattered lives they left in their wake. In the aftermath, Glacier Pine shut down for a while. Too many disappearances, too many deaths they couldn't explain away. When it reopened, they never spoke about what really happened. Bad for tourism, I guess. They put up some new signs, stronger warnings about wildlife encounters, but the thing that lurks in those mountains, no sign can prepare you for that kind of evil. The other rangers, they look at me differently now. There's pity in their eyes, a silent respect tinged with something like fear. They say I'm lucky to be alive, but I'm not so sure. Some days, especially when the wind whispers through the trees with a sound too much like a scream, I think the dead are the lucky ones. As for me, I never went back to being a park ranger. Couldn't bear the sight of those trees, the smell of pine needles that would forever be married to the stench of blood and that inhuman screech. I work at a hardware store now, stocking shelves and selling power tools. It's dull, mind-numbing even, but it's safe. The closest I get to the wilderness is a potted plant I almost killed on my windowsill. Sometimes, late at night, I wake in a cold sweat, the phantom pain of claws and teeth a chilling reality. I stare out at the city lights, the rumble of traffic, and I wish, with every fiber of my being, for the silent, shadowed dangers of the forest. Because out there, the monsters have a face, a terrifying, tangible form. Here, in the city, the monsters are faceless. They hide in plain sight, in dark alleys and whispered threats. And sometimes, I think the worst monsters of all are the ones we carry within ourselves. Okay, let me tell you, being a ranger at Big Cypress National Preserve isn't all sunshine and canoe tours. Sure, it's a sweet gig most of the time, but this place, it has a wildness to it that seeps into your bones. My name's Wyatt. Been looking after these swamp lands for just about a decade now. I had my share of snake sightings gator encounters, even a run-in with a Florida panther so close I could smell its musky hide in the hot, humid air. But what I saw a few weeks ago, that was something else entirely. It all started off normal enough, routine patrol duty, charting some new backcountry hiking trails Florida in the dead of summer is brutal even with the shade provided by the gnarled cypress trees and their canopy of Spanish moss. Sweat soaked through my uniform within minutes, and the mosquitoes were a whining, bloodthirsty nightmare. I was ready to call it a day when I came across a section of the trail that looked off. The palmetto undergrowth had been trampled flat, branches snapped with unnatural violence, like some huge beast had torn through the area. Now, we get feral hogs out here, and they can cause some damage, but this felt different. And the smell. Jesus, it was rank, like rotting meat mixed with a wet dog musk that sent the little hairs on my neck standing straight up. I thought about turning back, radioing it in. But something stubborn in me wanted answers, wanted to know what the hell could have done this. Big mistake, as it turns out. I followed the trampled trail deeper into the swamp, the dense tangle of mangroves closing in around me. The buzzing of the insects and the rhythmic croaking of unseen frogs created a strange symphony, unsettling in its rhythm. Then, I saw it up ahead a clearing where the old-growth cypress trees opened up into a sore of pond, the water thick and algae-ridden. And in the center of that clearing, partially obscured by the tangled roots and hanging moss, was the source of the destruction and the stench. A carcass. 
A deer, by the looks of it, but torn apart in a way no predator I knew would manage. Its legs were ripped off as if by brute force, the bones jagged and exposed. And its head, its head was missing. I gagged, but morbid curiosity got the best of me. My boots squelched in the mud as I approached, swatting away the mosquitoes that swarmed my face. That's when I saw the footprints. They weren't like anything I'd ever seen. Too large for a bear, too long and narrow for any big cat. And the thing is, there weren't four prints, only two. Like it walked upright on massive, clawed feet. A jolt of primal fear surged through me, the kind you get when the back of your brain screams that you're prey. I started backing away slowly, trying not to make a sound. I knew better than to run, knew that would just trigger whatever made those tracks. I'd raised my rifle, more to steady my nerves than out of any real belief that bullets could stop this thing. That's when I heard it, a rustling from the mangroves behind me. The hairs on my arms prickled. I was trapped. Slowly, so damn slowly, I turned, the rifle unsteady in my sweaty hands. Between the twisting branches and hanging vines, it emerged. At first, all I saw was its height, towering a good two heads above me. Then, it stepped out into the wan sunlight, and my breath caught in my throat. Its body was lean and wiry, not bulky at all, covered in patchy, grayish fur. The skin was stretched tight over bone making its ribs and skull painfully visible. But its face, God, it looked like a man's face twisted into some nightmarish parody. The mouth stretched too wide for its skull, lined with rows of jagged teeth, far too many teeth. And the eyes, damn those eyes. Pale blue and rimmed in red, they stared at me with a chilling intensity, filled with a predatory hunger that seemed as old as the swamp itself. It held its arms low, the hands disproportionately large ending in hooked claws that dragged along the muddy ground. We stood there frozen, me and the creature. My heart pounded in my ears, a death march for what was surely about to happen. It tilted its head, let out a low, rasping growl that raised goosebumps all along my arms. It bared its teeth in a grotesque, broken-toothed smile. Then, just as it seemed about to charge, a firecracker went off to my left, a loud pop that shattered the muggy silence. The creature flinched, whipping its head toward the sound. I caught a glimpse of movement through the trees, another ranger, Torres, I think. I didn't waste the moment. I turned and ran, the sounds of the creature crashing through the undergrowth in pursuit ringing in my ears. I stumbled blindly, branches tearing at my clothes, the fetid swamp water splashing against my legs as I ran, driven by a desperate, terror-fueled need to escape whatever lurked in those depths. I don't know how far or how long I ran. Finally, I collapsed behind a cypress tree so massive you'd need three people to reach around it. I gasped for breath, my lungs burning, the metallic taste of fear at the back of my throat. I didn't dare look back, just listened, straining to hear any sound of pursuit. Just when I thought I might pass out from terror, I heard another noise. Not the crashing of the creature, but the crunch of boots and the rustle of gear. A voice called out my name, hesitant at first, then growing louder as Torres came into view, her rifle raised, a look of worry etched on her face. Wyatt, what the hell happened? I saw you tearing through there like a bat out of hell. She lowered the rifle, but kept a wary eye on the edge of the tree line. Are you hurt? What chased you? 
my words tumbled out in a panicked babble, half-formed descriptions of the creature and the carnage I'd stumbled upon. Torres listened intently, her eyes widening with a mix of disbelief and a deep-seated fear I recognized all too well. See, the thing is, folks who work in these remote, wild places, we hear the whispers. Stories passed down about odd happenings, strange sightings at the edge of the known world. Usually, you write them off, too much moonshine, heat stroke hallucinations, that sort of thing. But what I saw, that was no trick of the light. Torres, she didn't laugh or question my story. Instead, she nodded grimly and called it in, her voice tight with tension as she described the situation to dispatch. We hunkered. Down to wait for backup, surrounded by the haunting symphony of the swamp and the gnawing dread of what might be lurking in the shadows. It seemed like hours before the others arrived, a whole search team armed to the teeth and grim-faced. They scoured the area, even found the clearing and what remained of the deer carcass. I pointed them toward the mangled path and the unnatural footprints in the mud, bracing myself for the skepticism. But there was something about the way they moved, the hushed tones, the wary glances toward the dense undergrowth, they'd seen enough to believe. Or at least, enough to know I wasn't lying. They didn't find the creature that day. No trace, just that lingering stench of rotten meat and the echoes of its chilling growl that still haunted my nightmares. The area around the clearing was cordoned off, declared a temporary wildlife hazard zone. Some official story about a diseased animal attack to avoid sending panicked tourists running for the hills. Me and Torres, we were told to keep our mouths shut, standard debriefing procedure. But we knew. That was two weeks ago. Everything's gone eerily quiet since. Torres reckons the creature's smart, laying low after the search party disrupted it. Some folks whisper that the park higher-ups called in specialists, trappers or something, guys who deal with the things that most people pretend don't exist. Part of me hopes they find the creature, end this before it hurts anyone else. The other part, the part chilled to the bone by those pale eyes and that inhuman growl, knows that some things are better left undiscovered. You see... I worked at Big Cypress long enough to get that feeling, like the land itself is watching, holding secrets deeper than any root and older than any cypress tree. We humans, we like to think we have dominion over the wild places, name them, map them, carve out our little trails. But some corners of the world, like the heart of the swamp where I saw that creature, they remain untamed, untouched. And sometimes, what dwells in those places, it looks back. A change has come over the preserve since that day. Rangers walk the trails in pairs now, and an unspoken tension clings to the air as thick as the summer humidity. We jump at every rustle in the undergrowth, every pair of glowing animal eyes in the fading twilight. And that carcass, the thing is... More deer are turning up half-eaten, torn open in that same brutal fashion. Whatever dwells out there, it's getting bolder, hungrier. You ever hear of the skunk ape? That's a cryptid folk swear haunts these parts, a foul-smelling, bipedal primate. Some say it's just a legend, a good way to sell cheap souvenirs at roadside stands. After what I saw... I'm not so sure. Maybe that's what that mangled carcass was really about. Maybe I'm not the only one with fresh nightmares in these parts. As for me, I've requested a transfer. Can't be around that swamp anymore, not with those eyes burned into my memory. I've seen wilderness turn from paradise to hunting ground in the blink of an eye. 
that kind of change, it seeps into your soul. They assign me to Joshua Tree National Park, desert, wide open spaces, nothing but rock and spiky plants as far as the eye can see. Should be safe, right? I hope so. Because I'm not sure I could handle another encounter like that, another reminder that the world's a lot bigger and a lot less civilized than we like to think. Some nights, lying in a motel room between shifts, I still hear the swamp sounds in my head, the croak of the bullfrogs, the whine of the insects, the rustling of something unnaturally large moving through the trees. And in those moments, I wonder if I made the right decision running away like that. Maybe a part of me stayed back there in the murky water and cypress trees, back with the creature that defied all reason. The other rangers, the ones who know, they look at me with a sore of silent understanding, a grim camaraderie born of shared fear. Torres, she offered to put in a transfer request as well, said we could face the unknown together. But what if facing it, really facing it, is worse than the haunting dread of not knowing? Sometimes I think that creature, with its broken smile and its hungry eyes, wasn't just hunting for deer that day. I think maybe it was hunting for something else, a darkness it recognized in me, or maybe just a challenge to its dominion over those ancient, forgotten depths. And whatever it found, or didn't find, a part of me fears it'll keep looking. Because the wild places, they have a way of calling you back, even after they show you their teeth. I took that job as a ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park because it was supposed to be peaceful. Tourists with cameras, black bears with bad manners, maybe the occasional litter bug, that's what I signed up for, some fresh air and exercise between college semesters. Turns out, fate and them park brochures have a real twisted sense of humor. My name's Rhett, by the way. And if you ever find yourself hiking the backcountry of the Smokies, be a pal and just turn right around. The first few months on the job were standard stuff, clearing trails, giving directions to hopelessly lost hikers with fancy map apps that somehow still got them turned around. Even the poacher with the scraggly beard and more teeth than sense wasn't all that weird in the grand scheme of things. It got truly strange a little after my one-year anniversary at the park, right around when those old, gnarled apple orchards in the remote Cataloochee Valley started to stir. I always felt a prickle at the back of my neck around those orchards, if I'm honest. They've been there for centuries, back when settlers first called this place home, and the trees have a hunched, twisted look to them, like they're burdened by secrets. Folks like to tell ghost stories about the area, about those early settlers and how they vanished into the mist, but you don't survive out here by letting campfire tales do your thinking for you. Still, come apple season, there's a change in the air, something wild and watchful buzzing just beneath the surface. That's why they sent me when Elwood from the maintenance crew radioed in with a shaky voice claiming something tore his buddy limb from limb. Maintenance guys don't get rattled easy, so I hopped into the old jeep and headed up the winding mountain road towards Catalucci. It was getting on towards dusk, and those thick smoky mountain forests swallow the light fast. I reached the orchard as the last of the sun dipped below the ridge. Half-rotten apples lay scattered on the ground, a sickly sweet smell hanging thick in the air. Elwood was crouched behind the rusted hulk of an ancient tractor, tears streaming down his mud-streaked face, mumbling something about the devil. I knelt beside him, trying to make sense of his ramblings, and that's when I spotted the body. Well, what was left of it, anyway? Whoever, or whatever, 
got to Elwood's buddy didn't do it gently. Raked claw marks marred the ground, and what lay in the center of the carnage was barely recognizable as human. Now, I've seen bear attacks before, but this was different. The wounds were too precise, too intentional. Like whatever did this enjoyed the process. A shiver ran down my spine. Elwood was still jabbering, and I strained to catch his words. Thing on two legs, fast, too fast, big as a horse, it sounded crazy, even as he said it, but there was a wild terror in his eyes that sent a chill straight down my gut. We're getting you out of here, I said, more to steady myself than him. I hauled Elwood to his feet, and, half dragging him, we stumbled towards the jeep. I had to leave the scene as it was, no way I was going back out there tonight, not with the darkness closing in and the feeling that beady eyes were watching us from the tree line. Back at the ranger station, the report I filed caused raised eyebrows and worried frowns. It got sent up the chain of command, those shiny shoe desk jockeys in the main offices deciding what to do. A specialist team was dispatched, wildlife biologists, they said, though the stoic look on their faces told me they suspected more than your standard problem bear. Armed guards were assigned to the orchards, the area closed off to the public pending the investigation. Somehow, word always gets out around these parts, and those ghost stories around the Catalucci orchards took on a new, vicious edge among locals. They avoided the area, the usual curiosity replaced by a deep respect born of old fears bubbling back to the surface. Of course, they sent me out with the specialists, my familiarity with the terrain the flimsy excuse. The specialists weren't the chatty type. They poked and prodded the scene of the attack, snapped soil samples, did that whispering among themselves thing that always makes me itch to throw a punch and make them talk straight. One of them, a tall woman with eyes that seemed to see a bit too much, found something tucked into the gnarled branches of an apple tree. A tuft of fur, coarse and oily, the color of a thundercloud. The lab results never came back, or if they did, I never saw them. For a few weeks, things seemed to quiet down. Then, old man Jenkins, who lived in a cabin so far up the creek you could practically smell the Tennessee border, staggered down to the station, eyes wild, babbling about his sheep, about their carcasses drained bloodless, about a monstrous shape in the moonlight, all claws and teeth and burning eyes. He was missing a few fingers, the wounds ragged, like they'd been snapped clean off, not bitten. The specialists got called back with an increased sense of urgency. This wasn't just about protecting tourists anymore. If Jenkins was right, this was a clear and present danger, and we were sitting ducks waiting to get picked off. The next few nights were tense. Patrols doubled near the orchards, and the specialists set up motion sensor cameras throughout the valley. I barely slept, tossing and turning in my bunk, the image of Jenkins' severed fingers seared into my mind. Fear clung to the station like the morning fog that crept up from the river, heavy and suffocating. We all knew what this was building towards even if none of us were foolish enough to speak it aloud. Then came the morning Peterson, one of the armed guards, didn't return from his night watch. We organized a search, dread settling like ice in our stomachs. We found him halfway up an ancient oak tree. What was left of him, rather? It was carnage, torn limbs, exposed bone, the bark stained crimson. Above it all, etched deeply into the trunk, was a crude symbol. It looked like a clawed hand, but with too many fingers, all twisted and wrong. None of us recognized it, 
but the specialists exchanged grim looks. They knew something, I could tell. That was it, the dam broke. We couldn't wait around until the thing decided to pick us off one by one. The specialists finally cracked, the tall woman admitting in a terse voice that they were dealing with something, old. Something not in the biology textbooks. Folklore, she'd whispered, like she was ashamed to even say the word. Turns out, those ghost stories about the Catalucci settlers weren't so far-fetched after all. Turns out, there are things lurking in these mountains, things older than the first pioneer's axe, older even than the mighty trees themselves. The Cherokee, they knew about these things, told stories passed down through countless fires, warning future generations. Creatures that walked like men but weren't, hungry mouths full of too many teeth, eyes reflecting only the darkness that birthed them into the world. I think that's when the true hopelessness set in. This wasn't a rogue bear or a mountain lion with an attitude problem. This was something rooted deep in the bones of the land, and we were a bunch of greenhorns with fancy tracking equipment about to stumble into an age-old fight. But surrender wasn't an option either, not with the specter of what happened to Peterson, Jenkins, and who knows how many others before them, haunting us. The specialists laid out the plan, a desperate gamble. We'd lure the creature back to the orchard and set a trap, a choke point where we could concentrate our firepower. The bait? Elwood. Poor, blubbering Elwood with his broken mind, was the only one who'd seen the creature and lived. He'd be wired to the gills with sensors and cameras, and the rest of us, well, we'd be the welcoming committee tucked amidst the rotting apples, guns loaded and fingers trembling. The night of the ambush, the valley shimmered under a full moon. Elwood, bless his shattered soul, played his part to perfection, his cries of garbled terror echoing amidst the gnarled apple trees. The minutes crawled by agonizingly slow. My heart jackhammered in my chest, and I could hear the ragged breaths of the others concealed nearby. And then, there it was. It slunk out of the shadows at the edge of the orchard, moving not like a bear or a big cat, but with a jerky, inhuman gait. It was taller than any man, hunched over, its skin a mottled, corpse-like gray. Its limbs were too long, ending in wickedly clawed hands that twitched in perpetual hunger. But worst of all was the head, elongated wolfish, but with a sickening parody of a human face stretched over the bone. Its eyes burned with a greedy, ancient light as they scanned the orchard, finally settling on the whimpering figure of Elwood. It charged. For all its awkwardness, it was unnaturally fast, closing the distance in seconds. We opened fire the moment it was in range. The air filled with the roar of gunfire and the creature's echoing screeches of surprise and pain. I saw bullets rip into its flesh, tear chunks but they didn't seem to slow it down much. It snatched Elwood off the ground like he was a ragdoll, those monstrous claws piercing his gut. He screamed, once, before his body went limp. The creature didn't linger to savor its meal. It turned and bolted back towards the shadows, leaving a trail of black blood that gleamed like tar in the moonlight. We gave chase, stumbling through the undergrowth, but it vanished as if it had dissolved into the night air itself. The aftermath was a mess, both literally and in the deeper way that gnaws at your spirit. They choppered Elwood's remains out, barely enough left to identify. We never found the creature, despite combing the woods for days. The specialists looked grim their equipment useless against something that defied biology. 
they packed up and left, citing inconclusive results in their sterile official report. The Catalucci orchards are fenced off now, warning signs plastered all around. The official story is contamination scare, something vague and reassuring. The locals, they know better, and so do I. I quit the service a few months later. Couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, even in my own dang apartment. Took a groundskeeping job at a golf course in Florida, flat as a pancake and swarming with rich old folks instead of ancient monstrosities. Sometimes, late at night, I dream I'm back there in the Smokies. I smell the rotting apples and the damp green freshness of the forest. From the darkness of the orchard, those eyes gleam at me, filled with an intelligence as cold and timeless as the mountains themselves. And I wake up in a sweat, convinced that someday, somehow, it'll come looking for me. Because things like that, they don't forget those who cross their path and live to tell about it. Let me tell you straight up, Olympic National Park ain't no walk in the woods. Sure, there's your postcard perfect scenery, old growth forests, rain shadow meadows buzzing with wildflowers, those snow capped peaks. But the deeper you go, the wilder it gets. This place swallows folks who don't respect it. They think they got their Gore Tex jackets a downloaded map on their phone, and they're invincible, you know? Dumbass. Me? I'm Briar, park ranger for the past five years. Seen a few things that would curl a city slicker's toes, but this last week takes the damn cake. It started with the missing hiker report. A solo camper, experienced dude named Harlan, overdue from a three-day backpacking trip in the northern wilderness area. Standard procedure at first, trailhead checks, radio calls, the works. Trouble is, he vanished into thin air. No sign of his tent, gear, nothing. Now, folks disappearing out there? It's rare, but it happens. Could be foul play, could be a cougar, could be plain bad luck compounded by a damn fool decision. We sent out a search team, me included. I was with Hayes, a seasoned ranger with a nose for trouble. The first day, the hiking was tense but uneventful. That old growth forest, it closes in on you. Damp moss hangs from ancient trees like tattered curtains and the silence between birdsongs feels heavy, like it's got something to hide. That night, we camped in a small clearing where Harlan was last seen. Hayes, usually full of cheesy jokes and wilderness lore, was quiet, eyes scanning the tree line like he was expecting something to jump out. Made me twitchy too. The next morning, we found the first sign of trouble, a ripped open fanny pack, scraps of torn granola bar wrappers scattered like confetti. Animal attack? Maybe, but something about this felt off. Hayes found footprints nearby, too big for a bear, too strangely spaced. We radioed it in, the response crackly with tension. By afternoon, the drizzle that's a constant out here turned into a proper downpour. Slick rocks and muddy trails made the going slow. Hayes swore under his breath and pointed ahead. It was a deer carcass, half gnawed and way too fresh. Something big had been feeding on it recently. And the smell, rank and rotten, with an undercurrent almost like musty fur. My stomach lurched. That's when we heard it a rustle from the ferns, too loud, too heavy to be any animal I knew. Hayes and I exchanged a look, rifles raised. Whatever was out there, it was circling us. 
We moved back to back, scanning the dripping undergrowth. Every creak of a branch, every snap of a twig made my skin crawl. Suddenly, Hay swore, damn. He was clutching his leg, bright red blood seeping through his pants. Then I saw it, a flash of movement between the trees, a blur of sinewy limbs and matted, grayish fur. It was gone before I could get off a clear shot. Hayes, you okay? He was gripping a nasty-looking gash on his thigh, but the bite wasn't that deep. More like some big animal swatted him, not a full-on attack. Bastard surprised me, is all. Let's patch me up and get the hell out of here. We bandaged his leg best we could, the rain turning the blood a muddy pink, and started back towards base. That's when we sensed it was watching us. Not even a noise, more like a shift in the air, that feeling of unseen eyes on your back. We picked up the pace, the sense of dread thickening with every step. The forest seemed to darken even though it was only late afternoon. Rain drummed a frantic beat on the canopy, and my heart hammered in time to match it. Up ahead, a flicker of motion made me halt. Peering through the trees, I saw a clearing. And in its center, the creature. It was massive, a good seven feet tall if it stood upright, but it moved hunched, loping on powerful, elongated limbs that ended in huge, wicked claws. Its skin hung loose over protruding bones, a sickly grayish color with patches of fur so sparse it looked diseased. Its head was, hard to even describe. Skull-like with a stretched, toothy muzzle, and above those malevolent, slitted eyes rose a pair of knotted, antler-like protrusions. For a heartbeat, time seemed to freeze. Me, Hayes, and that unnatural beast, locked in a silent tableau. Then, as if a switch had been flipped, the creature let out a rasping snarl that echoed through the trees. Chills raced down my spine. This wasn't about food, wasn't about territory. This thing pulsed with a raw, hungry malevolence. Run! Hayes yelled, breaking the spell. We ran like hell itself was chasing us. We didn't look back, the sound of crashing branches and that snarling, ragged breath urging us on. My boots pounded against the rain-soaked forest floor, slick roots and rocks a treacherous blur. Hayes was struggling, his wounded leg slowing him down. Briar, keep going, he shouted, gasping for breath. Get help. The guilt was a knife in my gut, but I knew he was right. Whatever that thing was, we'd only slow each other down and we both knew how that sort of story usually ended. I burst from the tree line into a meadow, the open space both a relief and a new terror. With no trees to hide in, I was a moving target on an empty field. Behind me, the crashing noises stopped abruptly. Then, an ear-splitting shriek cut through the rain, chilling me to the bone. It was haze. I couldn't bring myself to look back, just ran mindlessly towards a cluster of ranger cabins off in the distance, the rain mingling with hot tears streaming down my face. I stumbled into the main cabin, soaked and gasping for breath, a ragged mess, and blurted out my story to the startled rangers inside. Their faces paled as I choked out a description of the creature, of Hayes. Jensen, the grizzled head ranger, swore, a rare sign of true alarm. We're sitting ducks out here. That thing, it ain't natural. Radio for immediate backup, he snapped orders, the cabin transforming into a hive of grim activity. Armed rangers piled into jeeps, driving rain whipping at the windows as they sped towards the forest's edge.
I went with them, guilt and adrenaline a toxic mix swirling in my veins. We regrouped at the tree line, the downpour easing into a persistent drizzle. Jensen surveyed the dripping forest with narrowed eyes. He was ex-military, tough as nails, but even he seemed rattled. Form up, he barked. That thing's still out there. Let's find what's left of Hayes and end this. We moved into the trees in a tense line, rifles raised and ready. The air buzzed with dread, punctuated by the drip of water from leaves and the squelch of our boots in the mud. The scent I'd noticed earlier, that rotten meat musk, hung heavy in the dampness. It grew stronger as we neared the clearing where I'd last seen the creature. The sight that greeted us. Jesus, I hope to never see anything like that again. Hayes wasn't, there was no body, just remnants smeared across the ground. Crimson-soaked patches of fur, a nod-off boot, and his ranger hat lying abandoned in the mud. One of the search team retched behind a tree. Another, a wide-eyed rookie, started muttering a prayer. Jensen's face hardened. Track it, he rasped, gesturing at the mess with a shaking hand. Track it down, and we put the bastard out of its misery. The trail led deeper into the uncharted parts of the park. It became harder to follow with the fading light and thickening undergrowth, but there was a clear pattern of destruction, ripped saplings, clawed up tree trunks, and the occasional splatter of blood that wasn't Hayes's. Whatever this thing was, it was hurt, and a wounded animal is at its most dangerous. The light failed entirely as night closed in. Jensen made the call to halt the search until dawn. We set up a hasty camp, a ring of pitiful campfires around a patch of sodden ground. No one slept much, every rustle, every snap of a twig setting nerves on edge. I drifted into a nightmare-ridden doze filled with Hayes's scream and the creature's malevolent eyes. First light painted the forest in wan, sickly tones. We picked up the trail again our grim procession winding through a tangle of primeval wilderness. The track ended abruptly at a sheer cliff overlooking a mist-shrouded ravine. There was a dark spatter near the edge, more of the creature's blood. It looked like it took a nasty fall, but there was no body at the bottom of the ravine, just swirling fog. It's over, Jensen muttered more to himself than anyone else. Damn thing was hurt bad, likely crawled off to die somewhere we'll never find it. There was no relief in his voice, just resignation. We hiked back out, a somber, defeated crew. They put the incident down as an unexplained animal attack, hushed up the worst of the details to keep from scaring off tourists. Harlan, the original missing hiker, was never found. Life at the ranger station returned to a semblance of normalcy, but there was a lingering unease, a watchfulness that never quite left us. A few months later, I quit the park service. Got myself a little cabin off the grid as far away from the Olympic wilderness as I could get. I tried explaining what I saw to folks, but got those pitying looks, the concerned frowns. After a while, I learned to keep my mouth shut. Doesn't matter if they believe me. I know. Some nights, lying awake as the wind whistles through the cracks in the walls, I hear sounds at the edge of the clearing. A heavy tread, a rasping snarl that makes my blood run cold. On those nights, I bar the door, load my rifle, and wait for a pair of glowing eyes to emerge from the darkness. Because I figure that creature ain't done with me yet. Maybe it never will be. Maybe some things, some unknowable horrors lurking at the edge of the wild places, 
are best left undisturbed. And maybe some debts, some terrible balances, can only be settled in blood. Okay, I never really believed those stories about Crater Lake. You know, Native American legends about monsters in the depths? Yeah, dismissed them as campfire tales designed to scare off tourists. Now, well, let's just say I ain't so sure anymore. My name's Wyatt, park ranger for the past seven years, and I've seen the underbelly of nature. But this, this was something else entirely. It started subtly enough. Hikers complaining they felt eyes on them, a couple whispers about weird noises echoing from the caldera at night. Then, the water incidents. One kid, out on a kayak, swore something big bumped his boat from underneath. Later, a swimmer said she felt something snag her leg deep below the surface, swore up and down it wasn't snagged on a rock. Standard protocol is to chalk it up to overactive imaginations, especially at a place like Crater Lake. That deep blue water? It hides its secrets well. But I've always had a sixth sense about these things, and this nagging unease was growing. So, when a local fisherman vanished, boat tipped over, no sign of him whatsoever, I decided enough was enough. Next evening, armed with a service boat and a couple of those underwater cameras divers use, I headed out to the center of the lake. That water, it's not just deep, it's cold enough to freeze your bones even on a late summer night. Stars reflected on its surface, the caldera rim a ragged edge of blackness against the sky. Perfect setting for a horror flick, right? I lowered the camera into the depths, its light cutting a pale comb through the darkness. At first, nothing. Then, about seventy feet down, a flicker of movement. My heart jumped. On the screen, a massive, serpentine shape twisted back and forth. Too big to be a fish, too smooth to be a tangle of logs. I fumbled for the camera control, zooming in closer. And that's when I saw its head. Huge, vaguely reptilian, with eyes that reflected the weak light as dull green orbs. The camera bumped something then, and the creature was gone, vanishing into the abyss. Shaking, I hauled the camera back up. Murky images flickered on the screen, scaled hide a long, toothy mouth. Proof. Proof we had something down there, something that didn't fit into any textbook. I sat there in that little boat, knowing I had two options, report it and get laughed at, maybe lose my job, or hunt the damn thing down myself. Call me crazy, but option two started to sound real appealing. It wasn't about science anymore not just about proving everyone wrong. It was a primal instinct, the hunter in me rising up. This thing had messed with my park, might have hurt people. That made it personal. Next couple days were a blur. Stocked up on supplies, borrowed one of those underwater sonar things for maintenance. They probably thought I was going fishing. Finally, one moonless night, I was back at the lake, armed to the teeth with everything from harpoons to rifles. Yeah, I knew guns were useless underwater, but hey, there's something reassuring about firepower. Out on the lake, I cut the engine and the silence closed in. The sonar blipped softly, showing a steady heartbeat from the depths, the creature, somewhere down there. I lowered the underwater lights and waited. Time stretched out. My neck prickled, the feeling of being watched was back, stronger than ever. Then, a ripple on the water a few yards off. 
my breath hitched. Slowly, a shape began to emerge from the darkness. It took everything I had not to scream. The creature was massive, easily the length of two buses head to tail. Its body was eel-like, covered in what looked like iridescent scales that shimmered under the lights. In its head, those dull green eyes, now the size of dinner plates, were leveled right at me. Its mouth opened, revealing a maw lined with teeth like daggers. This thing wasn't some misunderstood lake dweller. This was an apex predator, and I was its next meal. I fumbled for a harpoon. The creature surged forward, its vast body knocking the boat sideways. I went overboard, the frigid water shocking the breath out of me. Frantically, I swam for the surface, but I could already feel it below me, a powerful shape slicing through the dark. I broke the surface, gasping, and saw the creature lunge, its jaws snapping shut just inches from my legs. Blindly, I thrashed toward the bobbing boat, managed to scramble back and just as it struck again, its teeth gouging the side of the vessel. The boat lurched and started taking on water. I worked the radio, my fingers clumsy with cold and terror. Mayday, mayday. This is Ranger Wyatt, Crater Lake Sector. Requesting immediate. My words cut off as the creature ran the boat again. The radio splashed into the dark water, followed by me. I went under, the world swirling in a rush of bubbles and heart-stopping fear. A massive head loomed out the murk, and then those jaws clamped around my leg. The pain was unimaginable, a white-hot surge that sent shockwaves through my body. The creature's teeth were like a steel trap, and I could hear the sickening crunch of bone. Blindly, I thrashed my free leg, kicking wildly at its scaly snout. It shook me, back and forth, the water churning red around us. I managed to twist my torso, desperately aiming my rifle at the creature's dimly glowing eye. My fingers squeezed the trigger, and the gunshot echoed strangely underwater. The creature roared, a horrific, ululating bellow, and released my leg. I surfaced, coughing and choking, a ragged scream clawing its way out of my throat. My leg felt like it had been shoved into a furnace. Blood welled from a ragged wound, slicking my skin and staining the water. But the creature, it was thrashing wildly, a dark stain spreading from around its eye socket. Enraged by the pain, blind in one eye now, it lurched towards me again. I knew even then that I had one chance, maybe less. Swimming was hopeless, the blood would draw it like a magnet. My only option was a gamble on the creature's sheer size. As it bore down on me, I dove, diving as deep as my ruined leg would allow, praying the boat was directly beneath. It passed like a freight train overhead, the rush of its immense body nearly dragging me under with it. A desperate surge upward, and my hand slammed into the splintered hull of the overturned boat. My lungs screamed for air, but I forced myself to wait. One second stretched into an eternity, then another. The creature had either given up, lost my scent in the spreading blood, or was circling for another attack. My vision started to blur, black speckles swarming at the corners. I was done for. And then, a flicker of light above. Dim and distorted, but enough. One of those underwater spotlights, attached to the boat, must have survived intact. Blindly, I grabbed it, tore its wire free, and aimed it upwards. The creature reacted instantly. The light seemed to torment its wounded eye. It thrashed, momentarily disoriented. 
just enough time. Summoning every last ounce of strength, ignoring the agonizing burn of my mangled leg, I clawed my way onto the overturned hull, ripping the harpoon free of its mounting. The creature swerved back around, homing in on me despite the searing light. I screamed a defiance into the dark water, steadied myself on the rocking hull, and aimed. The harpoon flew, a last desperate throw. It struck true, sinking deep into the thick scales of its neck. The creature shrieked again, a piercing sound that vibrated through the water, making my skull throb. It thrashed against the harpoon line, shaking the boat so hard I nearly tumbled back in, but the line held. Gasping, almost delirious with pain and exertion, I fumbled for my knife. The line wouldn't hold for long. If I cut it, maybe it would bleed out, swim away, anything but coming back for me. Seconds blurred together as I sawed at the thick rope. Just when my arm felt ready to fall off and my vision darkened, the rope parted with a snap. The creature twisted and dived, disappearing into the lake's depths, dragging the line and harpoon along with it. I sagged onto the boat, the trembling and the pain finally crashing over me. Then, somewhere between the darkness of the water and the darkness creeping towards the edges of my sight, I saw another shape rising, the outline of a search and rescue boat, its spotlight beaming across the water. I don't remember much after that. Flashes of harsh lights, the rough handling of EMTs, the nauseating lurch of a helicopter ride. When I properly woke up, I was in a hospital bed, my leg a massive cast, my memory hazy with painkillers. The story that came out was simple, boating accident, lucky to have been found in time. Nobody believed me about the creature, of course. They blamed hallucinations, the head injury I'd somehow gotten during all the chaos. Search and rescue divers found no sign of the sunken boat, the lights, the harpoon line, nothing. Case officially closed. I was labeled the ranger who'd cracked under the stress, maybe even gone a bit unhinged. But I know what I saw. And I know that it's down there, lurking in those icy depths, with a freshly wounded eye and a score to settle. They offered me relocation, some cushy desk job in Yellowstone or maybe Yosemite. Safer parks, so they said. I turned them down. I'm not leaving Crater Lake. That thing picked the wrong ranger to mess with, and I owe it a rematch. Maybe I'm crazy, or maybe it was just a freak of nature, some oversized lake eel gone rogue. But maybe, just maybe those native legends held a grain of truth, a terrifying truth lost in time. Right now, I'm waiting. Waiting to heal up, stocking up on better gear. Next time I head out onto that lake, I won't be just armed. I'll be ready to finally answer the question that's burned in my brain ever since. What the hell lurks in the depths of Crater Lake, and can a man possibly kill it? Look, Bryce Canyon National Park? That place is a whole different kind of weird. I'm Rowan park ranger for eight years, and I thought I'd seen it all. But those hoodoos, they get to you. Tall, skinny rock spires sticking up like twisted fingers, and if you listen real close on a quiet night, I swear you can hear them whispering to each other. Still, never consider them dangerous, just, unsettling, maybe. Then, a few months ago, we had that hiker disappear. Not uncommon sadly, folks get cocky, think the trails are all Disneyland rides or something. This one though, vanished right on the Queen's Garden Trail. Super popular, plenty of witnesses, and poof. 
dude was just gone. Search and rescue found nothing, not even a backpack or a water bottle. Just those eerie hoodoos standing there like they knew something they weren't telling. Turns out, that was just the beginning. After that, it was like something flipped a switch. The place got darker. Hikers coming back shaken, talking about feeling watched, hearing rustling sounds when they were dead sure they were alone. One couple said their dog, a big German shepherd, cowered all night, whining and refusing to go near the rim after sunset. Animals know things, I figure. Things got worse for me when they sent me out solo to do an overnight survey on the Navajo Loop Trail. That whole area, it gives me goosebumps even in broad daylight. The trees grow all tangled, blocking out the sun, and with all those hoodoos poking up, it's like being watched by a crowd of stone giants. But hey, gotta do the job, right? I tried to laugh it off, tell myself it was the usual wilderness paranoia getting to me. But around two hours in, right as dusk was settling, the hair on the back of my neck stood straight up. No sound, nothing like that, just a wrongness in the air, a prickly feeling that something had changed. And that's when I saw it. Not fully, just a flicker of motion between the trees. But I got enough, tall as a man, hunched over, but way too lean to be any kind of bear. In the skin, it was almost translucent, with a pattern of shadows swirling beneath it, like oil on a puddle. My gut twisted. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't meant to be seen in the light. I froze. It didn't seem to notice me, so with my hands shaking, I slowly backed away. Must have been twenty yards back before I risked a glance over my shoulder. That's when I saw its face. God, I wish I hadn't. The head was inhuman, not quite. Long, triangular, with eyes like two chips of black ice. Its mouth, that was the worst. Like a lamprey's, a round thing filled with rows and rows of tiny teeth. I turned and ran. Stumbled half-blind through those twisted trees, heart drumming so hard I thought it had burst. Tripped over a root, slammed my rifle into a rock. From behind me came a chittering sound, something like a laugh. Managed to scramble back up just in time to see the creature launch out of the shadows, way faster than anything that size had a right to move. I fired a shot, more of a panic reaction than anything else. Hit something, because it let out that chittering screech again, louder now. But the damn thing just flickered back into the shadows, as if it was made of smoke and darkness itself. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs felt like jelly. Found a little clearing and, without much of a plan, hunkered down, rifle at the ready and my eyes glued to the writhing blackness under those damn trees. Hours passed. The noises from the woods, they were indescribable. Scuttling, chittering, that eerie laughter thing echoing through the canyons. I knew, without a doubt, that it was out there. Waiting. Maybe toying with me, maybe letting the terror grow. Just as the sky began to lighten, I heard it, the crack of a twig, way closer than it had been all night. I whirled around, rifle raised, but there was nothing to see. Slowly, I lowered the gun. And that's when I smelled it, like wet leaves in a butcher shop left out in the sun. I whipped around again. Perched on a rock outcrop, maybe twenty feet away, was the creature. In the faint dawn light, I could see it properly now. Its skin was the mottled gray of weathered stone, but patterned underneath with branching, 
pulsating veins that looked filled with black oil. In its eyes, those flat black eyes watched me with a chilling intelligence that made my blood freeze. Then it slowly tilted its head, almost curious. It opened its lamprey mouth to reveal two rows of those horribly small teeth, and let out a soft hiss, almost a sigh. I knew, then, that it wasn't playing anymore. This was the start, the predator lining up its prey. For a split second, I was paralyzed, my fingers still on the useless rifle trigger. And then, a spark of something, not courage, more defiance, flared within me. I lifted the rifle and fired. The creature screeched and jerked back, but the bullet had only grazed it. I fired another shot, this time catching it square in the chest. Black blood splattered across the rock. The creature let out a piercing shriek that echoed through the canyons, filled with fury and pain. Yet, there was something else there, surprise, maybe even disbelief. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't used to getting hurt. That flicker of hope turned into a burning determination. It stumbled, then turned and leapt off the rock into the darkness below. I bolted in the opposite direction, not caring about the noise, just survival. The chase was on. It moved like a slithering nightmare through the broken terrain, but I knew the trails, and desperation gave me a burst of speed. But those damn hoodoos were everywhere, looming shapes that both concealed it and gave it new places to ambush from. Twice, it lunged at me, its teeth snapping inches from my face. Twice, I managed to twist away, blindly firing the rifle more like a club than a weapon. As the first real rays of sunlight pierced the treetops, I reached a familiar landmark and overlook right on the rim of the canyon. Maybe, just maybe, the open space would make it retreat. I stumbled over the rim, gasping for air, and turned to face the creature as it burst through the trees behind me. And something about the golden light hitting its oily skin made it falter. It hissed, rearing back as wisps of black smoke curled off its form. My chance. Backing further towards the edge, I fumbled for the radio at my belt, fingers clumsy with fear and exhaustion. Control, this is Ranger Rowan, Navajo Loop Sector, I choked out, voice ragged. Emergency situation, unidentified hostile entity. Rowan? Control's voice crackled through the radio speaker, edged with concern. What's your? I cut off the transmission, focused on the creature. It was stalking toward me, those black eyes burning in its triangular face. I could see its wound, a pulsing, black gash in its chest that hadn't healed. I'd heard it, maybe badly. I took one step back, then another. And then, I was at the edge. The canyon stretched below, a dizzying drop to the ochre and red desert floor below. Behind me, the creature hissed, inching closer. One more step, and I'd fall. Gamble everything on this thing not wanting to follow, maybe even being vulnerable to the sunlight I could now feel on my face. It felt like madness, but everything up to this point had been insane. The creature paused, the hiss turning into an uncertain rasp. Was it afraid of the height, or the light? It was close enough now, close enough to smell its charnel house breath, close enough to see every pulsing, oily vein under its skin. I held its gaze with every ounce of defiance I had left. Slowly, it lowered itself, flattening against the ground as if fearing the drop or maybe, preparing to pounce. The choice was mine. I made it. Here's hoping you hate heights, 
I muttered, and stepped off the cliff. The wind roared in my ears as I fell. For a few endless seconds, I was completely weightless, a tiny figure plummeting against the vast expanse of the canyon. Then the impact, the jolt of pain and then the blessed oblivion of darkness. I woke up much later in a hospital bed. Bad breaks, concussion, the usual fun stuff after you take a header off a cliff. My story? A crazy jumble, animal attack, hallucinations, maybe a slip and my imagination filled in the blanks. Nobody really believed me, of course. Search and rescue never found any trace of the creature. No blood, no tracks, no remains, despite them combing the whole canyon. They officially put it down as wild bear attack, fudged the timeline to account for me being missing two whole nights. But I know what I saw. And sometimes, especially right before I fall asleep, I feel a phantom burning on my skin where its oily blood touched me. I see those black eyes in my nightmares, filled with that cold, ancient intelligence and a burning hatred. Because it's still out there, somewhere in the shadows of those twisted hoodoos, licking its wounds and waiting for its chance to finish what it started. The doctors say PTSD, that given time I'll recover. But I don't think I will, not fully. Something from that canyon changed me left a mark deeper than any visible scar. And something else is out there, biding its time in the darkness. I can only hope none of my former colleagues have to see it like I did. They sent me away from Bryce Canyon, said it was for my own good. Some desk job in Yosemite, a national park famous for its waterfalls and big trees. Pretty safe, right? But now, sometimes at night, when I hear the wind whispering in those ancient branches, it sounds a whole lot like the chittering laughter of those hoodoo canyons. And I wonder if the eyes hidden in the darkness are truly so different from the ones I met in the desert. Okay, I've been a ranger at Redwood National Park for nearly a decade. Call me Silas. These giant trees, they do something to your headspace after a while, a kind of quiet awe that seeps into your soul. But lately, that peace has been replaced by a prickling unease, the feeling of being watched even in those cathedral-like groves. It started with some missing hikers, folks who wandered off trails or tried overnight backcountry trips alone. Happens every year, sadly. But this time there was something, off. No gear found, not even a stray boot or a granola bar wrapper. Like the earth had just swallowed them whole. Then came the whispers from hikers that did return, shaken and pale. They talked about weird rustling noises way up in the canopy, too high up for any critter. Talk about figures glimpsed just at the edge of the fog rolling in, disappearing like the fog itself. Most folks laughed them off, too much campfire wine, overactive imaginations. But something in me said listen. Next was the old growth section incident. A field research team, all seasoned outdoorsmen, radioed in, panicked. They reported a tremor not earthquake style, more like something huge had brushed past their camp. Then, they described, arms, they called them. Thick as tree trunks, pale and segmented, writhing down from the canopy. When a rescue team found the campsite, it was wrecked, gear scattered like a bear had ransacked it, but no bodies, no sign of struggle. Just a lingering smell the rescuers described as like wet leaves after a storm, only sickly sweet. That's when they called me in. Not my usual jurisdiction, but
but I have a reputation for handling the weird cases. I spent the first few days interviewing witnesses, mapping disappearances, trying to find a pattern, a rational explanation. But everything pointed towards that old growth grove, a section of Redwoods most tourists never visited. The feeling of wrongness clung to me like the ever-present coastal fog. Finally, I couldn't wait anymore. Packed a bag with some essentials and a discreet sidearm. Nobody official knew where I was going. I told myself it was just a long overdue solo hike, but we both knew that was a lie. Approaching the old growth grove, the unease ratcheted up to near panic. The usual forest sound seemed muted, a heavy silence pressing down like it was holding its breath. I reached the first of the ancient redwoods and put a hand against its rough bark. The scale of these giants is humbling. Something that's lived hundreds, maybe a thousand years, it deserves respect. And something in me, some survival instinct honed over my years in wilderness, screamed to turn back. Instead, I pressed on, following an old deer trail deeper into the grove. The fog thickened, swirling like it had a life of its own. The light filtering through the canopy was dim, greenish. Then I saw it, a flicker of movement high above. My heart slammed into my ribs. I froze, slowly scanning the upper branches. And that's when I saw the eyes. Two of them, dish-sized and a strange, mottled amber. They sat nestled among the thick branches, part of a segmented, pale form that blended almost seamlessly with the bark. An arm, no, more like a tentacle, thicker than my torso snaked down, its tip splitting into barbed, hook-like protrusions. For a suspended moment we just studied each other, predator and prey. Then its eyes narrowed and the air hummed, a low vibration that pulsed through the ground, through me. There was an intelligence there, cold and calculating, unlike anything I'd ever encountered. Survival instinct kicked in belatedly. I turned and ran, shoving down the scream building in my throat. The forest floor was slick with pine needles and decaying redwood bark, treacherous footing. Behind me came a crashing sound and the monstrous, segmented limbs whipping through the trees, impossibly fast. Stumbling, I caught a glimpse of the ground ahead falling away abruptly, an old, eroded ravine I'd completely missed in my panic. My only hope, however slim. I launched myself into a desperate leap, boots scrambling for purchase on the slick edge as I tumbled into the shadowy ravine. I hit the ravine floor with a bone-jarring thud. Pain exploded in my ankle but I scrambled to my feet anyway, ignoring the white-hot agony. Ahead of me, the ravine twisted into a narrow crevice barely wide enough for a person, choked with redwood roots and fallen branches. A monstrous crashing sound echoed from above. That, that thing was coming after me. I squeezed through the crevice, sharp roots tearing at my clothes and skin. The air grew colder, damper, as the rock walls closed in. I could barely see a few feet ahead, but stopping wasn't an option. Something wet and slick brushed my face in the darkness. I flinched back, my hand slapping across something that felt like, like tendrils, thin and wriggling. A choked cry escaped my throat. I was blundering towards its lair. The faintest bit of light filtered from above, a small opening in the rock, barely visible through the tangle of roots. Pure desperation fueled me. I half-crawled, half-climbed towards it, my twisted ankle screaming in protest. Then, I was hauling myself through the opening, tumbling onto solid ground. 
Blinking against the sudden daylight, I realized I was on a narrow ledge halfway up a cliff face overlooking the ocean. I'd fallen into a sea cave, some hidden recess the relentless Pacific waves had carved out over centuries. Below, the waves crashed onto a rocky beach littered with driftwood. And directly above me, it glared down, its massive segmented body wedged halfway out of the crevice. Its eyes, those monstrous amber eyes, locked with mine. A low, rumbling growl, if that's what you could even call it, echoed through the cave. And I knew then, this was no animal, no mutated oversized bug. It was sentient, malevolent, and it was pissed. One of its tentacle limbs snaked down, those hooked protrusions slicing through the air like monstrous claws. I scrambled back, heart pounding a frantic tattoo. If those things touched me, my mind reeled from picturing what happened to those other hikers, those researchers. That's when I saw it, wedged in a rock cranny, a coil of old, fraying fishing rope. Probably washed up during a storm and caught there. A surge of desperate hope. Might be my only chance. The monstrous limb snaked down again, closer. I snatched the rope, ignoring the splinters stabbing my palms, and did the only thing I could think of. I made a makeshift lasso. With a silent prayer to any god that might be listening, I took aim at one of the waving, hooked protrusions and tossed. Through luck or raw desperation, the lasso looped around one of the hooks. The creature jerked back with a screech that shook the cave walls. I scrambled to secure the other end of the rope around a jagged rock outcropping, praying it would hold. The creature thrashed, its segmented body heaving, echoing growls vibrating through my bones. The rope creaked, straining against the onslaught. And for one long, terrifying moment, I thought it might snap. But the rock held. The rope held. And the creature seemed to realize this. Its thrashing slowed, those amber eyes narrowing. And in that chilling gaze, I saw a flicker of something cold, calculating, like it was reassessing its strategy. With a sudden, fluid motion, it retreated back into the crevice. For a moment there was only silence, a dripping quiet echoing in the cave. Then, I heard a scuttling sound from above, and a shower of dust and pebbles rained down. It was going around. My blood ran cold. Panic threatened to swallow me whole, but I shoved it down. There must be another way out of this cave. Scrambling towards the back wall slick with sea mist, I found it, another crevice, narrower, choked with kelp and barnacle-encrusted rocks. Might lead back inland, maybe. It was barely wide enough to squeeze through, but it was a chance. Wedging my backpack in front of me, I inched my way in, sharp rocks shredding my sleeves. My bad ankle throbbed, and I could feel the beginnings of panic swelling again. But then, I saw it, a faint sliver of light up ahead. Claw my way forward, the light growing stronger, the kelp-choked passage widening. And finally, I burst free, tumbling out onto another cliff face this one covered in scrubby bushes and overlooking the thick forest inland. I didn't look back. Just started running, limping, stumbling, driven by pure, primal terror and the desperate will to survive. Hours later, dehydrated and bleeding from a dozen cuts, I staggered onto a dirt access road and flagged down a passing logging truck. The aftermath felt like a different kind of nightmare. Nobody believed my half-raving account, of course. Search and rescue teams found nothing at the cave, no sign of the creature, 
no trace of its lair within those crevices. Old, weather-worn rope? Must have been there the whole time, they said. I was diagnosed with PTSD, put on meds that made me feel like a sleepwalking ghost. They kindly offered me a desk job. I took it. I never went back to Redwood National Park. News reports of other vanished hikers trickle in, the cases eventually growing cold, but I know. Know that something lurks in those ancient groves, something monstrous, waiting to snatch up the unwary. And sometimes, especially at night when the city fog rolls in thick, almost like the sea-touched redwood fog, I feel those amber eyes on me. I know it's out there, calculating, biding its time. And I know, without a doubt, that it hasn't forgotten me. Look, being a park ranger at Joshua Tree National Park is about as chill as it gets. I'm Thaddeus, by the way, been here nearly six years. Mostly it's dealing with dehydrated tourists, the occasional idiot climbing where they shouldn't and putting out campfires. But lately, things been weird. Like, way beyond the usual desert fauna and lost hiker weird. It started with a humming noise. Low, vibrating, like it was coming from deep underground. Hikers reported it too out near the backcountry trails, making them uneasy but nothing they could pinpoint. Me, I'm not one for spooky vibes. Figured, some new power substation out on the highway, the sound traveling funny due to the rocks or whatever. Then things got darker. Like, literally. I was doing a solo night patrol, checking for those light pollution yahoos messing with the stargazing. And that's when I saw it, a patch of blackness blacker than the night sky, blotting out the stars. It swirled and moved in a way that made my skin crawl. Like a hole punched into the fabric of the world. That should have been the time to nope out of there, but something kept me glued to the spot. The humming was louder than ever now, the ground trembling beneath my feet. Then from out of that patch of impossible darkness, tentacles. Long, writhing things, smooth as oiled leather, reaching out like blind snakes. I stumbled back, tripped over some Mojave yucca, damn spiky things and that seemed to break the spell. I turned and ran. Stupid, I know, but pure, unadulterated fear had its claws in me. I remember the rustling sound as those tentacles slithered through the sand, chasing me. The humming, it was inside my head now, drowning out my ragged breaths, my pounding heart, Next morning I chalked it up to heat stroke or a weird desert dream. But I avoided that area for patrols. Figured, let someone else deal with whatever crazy mirage crap was out there. That worked for a while. Then came the disappearances. First was a pair of rock climbers, experienced guys from up in LA for the weekend. Vanished somewhere out near Split Rocks. Search and rescue combed every inch of the desert, helicopter spotting, the works. Nothing. Just their gear, neatly stacked by the trailhead. Like they'd stripped down and walked off into the sand. Three days later, it was an older couple in one of those giant RVs. The thing was found abandoned near the western park boundary, engine still idling, AC blasting in the midday heat. No bodies, no signs of struggle, not even a speck of blood. Just, gone. Everyone blamed it on the desert, gets to you if you don't respect it. Or maybe illegal border crossings gone sideways, who knows. But I knew. Saw that inky patch of darkness again, 
felt that damn humming. It was picking people off. And whatever it was, it was getting bolder. That's when I started preparing. I ain't stupid, I know I'm no match for whatever that thing is. But I figure if folks go missing on my watch, it's my duty to at least try and figure out why, maybe warn others before they become desert snacks for that entity. Got myself a night vision camera, the kind hunters use. Stocked up on flashbangs, figured if anything about that thing is light sensitive, it might give me a sliver of a chance. Even packed my grandpa's old service pistol, though I ain't sure bullets would work against an inky mass of tentacles. Tonight, I'm headed out to the Lost Horse Valley area. Hikers reported the humming noise centered around there. Guess I'll see up close what's calling them out into the darkness. I've got this gut feeling, it's now or never. This thing, it's getting hungrier, escalating, and soon the whole damn park might be its hunting ground. And if anyone can stop it, or at least get a good look at the damn thing so we know what we're dealing with, well, it's gotta be me. Lost Horse Valley was dead silent when I reached it. Not even the usual chirp of crickets. Just the soft whoosh of wind and the pounding of my own heart against my ribs. The night vision camera made everything look like an eerie green negative, every yucca became a spidery monster, each bolder a lurking presence. The humming, it was louder here, an oppressive throb that echoed in my skull. Gritting my teeth, I panned the camera across the landscape, searching for that impossible patch of blackness. But there was nothing. Just sand, rocks, and those twisted Joshua trees, their branches clawing at the moonlight. Minutes stretched on. The humming pulsed in time with my growing dread. I started to think I was going nuts. Maybe this was stress, paranoia from all the disappearances. Maybe I should just turn back, let some other poor ranger get. And then, I saw it. A flicker of inky darkness swirling between two outcroppings. There, then gone. But long enough for the camera to zoom in, grainy image swimming into focus. And I froze. Tentacles weren't entirely accurate. They were more like appendages, thick and segmented, ending in barbed hooks like some giant grotesque scorpion's claws. And rising from the center of those writhing limbs, a bulbous mass of a body, slitted with what I could only assume were eyes. Eyes that reflected back the pale green of the night vision with a chilling intelligence. I fumbled for a flashbang, but my fingers felt like clumsy sausages. The damn thing had spotted me. It lunged, a grotesque mass of shadow and hooked limbs, way faster than anything that size had a right to be. I dropped the camera, barely dodging the snatch of one of those claws. It tore through my backpack like tissue paper, scattering supplies. Stumbling backwards, I blindly fired the pistol. The noise in that silent desert was deafening. The creature jerked back, the flashbang I'd managed to toss going off right next to it with a blinding burst of light and sound. It let out a screech that was felt more than heard, a vibration that rattled my bones. The creature was disoriented, flailing. That was my chance. I ran for it. Sand kicked up, clogging my lungs, making my eyes water. Behind me came the rustling chase, the thumps of heavy impacts. Didn't need to look back to know it was gaining ground. Just when my legs were about to give out, and those barbed hooks were a breath away, I saw it, an old mineshaft entrance half concealed by rocks. Last ditch hope flared. I scrambled towards it, squeezed myself through the narrow opening, 
and rolled down into dusty darkness. I hit the ground hard, gasping. Above me, I heard an enraged screech and the scrape of claws on rock that made my teeth ache. The creature couldn't fit through the hole, but damn if it wasn't trying. I scrabbled around in the darkness, hands finding a rusted pickaxe, probably some relic from the prospector days. Holding it like a weapon, I edged back towards the mine entrance, heart pounding in my ears. The creature loomed above, its bulbous body a silhouette against the moonlight. A tentacle snaked down into the darkness, probing blindly. I gripped the pickaxe handle, a scream building in my throat, ready to die fighting. Then a new noise split the air. The whoop whoop of helicopter blades, and then the blinding beam of a searchlight. Search and rescue must have tracked my abandoned ranger jeep, followed my tracks. The creature screeched, a sound of pure hatred, and then it retreated, the probing tentacle disappearing. Shouts echoed from outside, and then faces were peering down the mine shaft, flashlights cutting through the gloom. I don't remember much after that. Getting hauled out, the medics fussing over me, someone wrapping me in a scratchy blanket, the usual post-shock blur. The camera was gone, probably snatched by the creature. Nobody believed what I told them, of course. Hallucinations, they said, maybe even an undocumented desert animal disturbed by their spotlight. They never found anything out there, no unnatural patches of darkness, no monsters with tentacles. The aftermath was a quiet sort of nightmare. I got my mandatory psych evaluation, a month's paid leave, and a subtle recommendation to consider a desk job in a less stressful park. I knew they all thought I cracked. That maybe I had. The thing was, that humming never truly left me. Even in my little apartment, back near the city, I can still hear it sometimes, a faint echo under the drone of traffic, the thrum of air conditioners. I haven't gone back to Joshua Tree. They tell me the disappearances have stopped, maybe the creature went dormant, moved on, or was just a fever dream of the desert to begin with. I don't argue, but I know what I saw. And I also know, even deserts thousands of miles away, even surrounded by concrete and cars, I'm never really safe. They assigned a new ranger out at Lost Horse Valley, a greenhorn with bright eyes and a love for Joshua Trees. I hope he never sees what I saw, never hears that damn humming. But if he does, I suppose I have one last duty. I keep my grandpa's old pistol clean and oiled. I still practice at the range, my aim steady. Because if that thing comes back, if it ever decides the greater Los Angeles area might make a tasty hunting ground, well, at least this time, I won't go down without a fight.